Then, yeah, just wear the beanie. That's it. That's pretty solid. I feel good about that. That's a good way to start this. Get the attitude up high, you know. Go trade two J's if you could become Wolverine. Where are you getting all this information? I definitely heard some some rumors about it. Are you still going? For, I, I can't get goosebumps thinking about it because it's like you can hear them get the car. I was going to qualify and I was going to drive it out the racetrack. Just threw the hood over the ditch and longest employee of Knox. You did some digging there, huh? All right, Formula Drift fans, we've got the merch deal back again. I was able to finagle my way in there, cut some deals, you know, grease some palms, all that fun stuff. So that means if you're looking for some awesome FD merch, you know what to do. Podcast 24 at checkout, save yourself 20%. So go head over to shopfd.com, get yourself some awesome shirts and hats and stuff like that. I'm still working out the hat deal. Don't worry, we'll, we'll figure out the hat deal. But for right now, head over to shopfd.com. Save 20%, use podcast24 at checkout. That's podcast, the number two, number four. I don't have to spell it all out. I'm saving you a bit of time and uh, save yourself 20%. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to The Outer Zone, the official podcast of Formula Drift. My name is Jacob Gettens, and we've got El Presidente on, Mr. Ryan Sage. Uh, what's going on, dude? Well, you know, I'm just here at the office by myself on a wonderful, I won't say the day and night because I don't want to, uh, you know, timestamp the the, uh, the interview or the podcast, but uh, hanging out here, it's nice and cool in the office. It's quiet. I get to work alone and uh, that's not always very common. So, but I'm glad to be with you and this is uh, pr- pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, especially with recent events, I doubt the quiet thing is is something that's been happening very often lately. Um what like, I know, I just feel like everything just kind of hit all at once. And I know, you know, there's, there's been so many discussions about basically all the announcements that have been going on and all the changes. And I feel like in the last couple of weeks, it's just been like hectic of like, okay, we can finalize everything, talk about everything. And, and really that's kind of the main thing that we're doing here. Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, once Irwindale ends, we go to, you know, preparations for SEMA this year was weird because we had SEMA Fest as well and then right into PRI and you know by the time you get done with that you're kind of in the middle of December you know we had we've been trying to push a lot of our administrative work back and back and back sooner and sooner and sooner so we can get driver registration up before the new year ticketing up before the new year so we can kind of try and enjoy that like one and a half two weeks of vacation time um but because we did that it kind of moved everything else forward too and then add in all of the standard off-season craziness and the sport developing and all that fun stuff and it just doesn't feel like there's really been a break at all i mean you take October, November, December, January, February, March, April, seems like a long time. It goes by so fast and it really isn't uh, (laughs) that much time. So, and then we had the RSR event too. So that's another thing that uh, happened in there as well. Yeah, it's been, it's been chaos. Was it like, did you know that midway through the season where you're like, oh, this off season is not going to feel like an off season or is it one of those, it's just all kind of came together that way. And next thing you know, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to have any real time off here. It's just going to be go, go, go. Yeah. I mean, I think there a certain part of it is when I came into this position, you know, we were trying to look at things that have been historically kind of solidified into the formula drift business um, and figure out whether or not they made a lot of sense. You know, Pro-Am was one of them, but also the way that we released events. You know, we'd always released our schedule at SEMA. It's been something that we've done the press conference for. And you know, it's like the most widely attended press conference at SEMA for years and years and years. But we kind of realized like, you know, teams are planning so far in advance. Some of these uh, dates are never going to change, like Long Beach and Road Atlanta, for example. And as we get these dates, you know, locked in, we might as well tell teams. And if we're going to tell teams, then really the only other people that need to know are the fans. And so do we need SEMA, which is a trade show, essentially, to announce our schedule or should we do like what we tried this year, which was to basically announce the schedule at Irwindale. And when you, when you do that, plus a lot of these other administrative functions that move forward, it just kind of changes the dynamics a little bit. It, 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 I think it does keep you on your toes because nothing is regular. Um, but ultimately at the end of the day, what you're trying to do is, is make it so that the people involved in the sport, whether it's employees or drivers or teams or whatever the case may be, have the best possible chance to get ahead at the end of the day. It's a massively uh, c- competitive marketplace. 
and knowing where you're going, knowing what the travel schedule is, knowing if it's going to be 1,500 more miles this year versus last year. If you knew that in April or May, when we solidified that date, it's a big difference compared to if you found out in November. So we've kind of just changed the thesis of how we you know, operate the company from like an information dissemination point of view. I feel like you you touched on just like an overarching change. I've been, I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, you know, part of it's like the the marketing person in me, but part of it is is very much like in full honesty is like this is the most amount of changes I think we've seen in drifting, at least in the last ten years, if not since day one. Or you know, is how how much of this is kind of you going more or less on your own as as the sole person. How much of this is, you know, just the way it's all worked out um, and how much of this is is just like, you know, we've we've been listening, we've been planning for this for a long period of time. It just happens to be when this all came together. It, there, it's a mix of a, a lot of different things. I mean, I think I'm at a point in my career where I kind of don't really give a crap anymore about <laughs> what people think about me. Um, and, you know, the the ultimate reality of doing this job is that you're trying to grow the sport as best you possibly can to take into account all of the people that are involved in FD from drivers, mechanics, representatives, um, all the people that help those people, all the people that support those people on the part side or whatever the case is. And, you know, when you look at it from a overhead point of view, from that perspective, you know, macro level, you know, you're going to start thinking about can we do things differently? And so like when I came into this position, like I, we definitely took some pretty sizable risks, but I, I kind of also recognize that. I... <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that a ding? No, I, was, I meant more for me. I just like, yeah, oh. I'm, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty large risk. So, oh, my, yeah. my email yeah. dinged at the same time too. Oh. So, so sorry about that. Um, no, 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 yeah, you were, you're not a risk, but, um, we did take some sizable, you know, risks financially as well. And some of the stuff, you know, worked out fine. Um, and other stuff is going to, it's a, it's going to be a process, but, you know, I'm in a position where, you know, I, I made a funny joke. I, I don't know if this is a funny joke, but I, I was talking to Vaughn and Matt field when we announced some of our, our changes, um, when I came into the position and I was like, man, you know, this is the kind of stuff I feel like I might get fired for if we mess it up. And, uh, and Vaughn said something pretty interesting to me. He was like, yeah, but you know what? Like, if you don't take any risk, it's, you're, you're just going to be stuck in the cycle of things. And there is, there is an element of, I think, truth to that is that, you know, a business, and you'll understand this, a business that grows organically needs to have an exogenous shock that they're not in control of. You know, say, for example, Fast and the Furious came out and, every, you know, all the aftermarket performance companies exploded, or you have to figure out a way to create that exogenous shock you know, by trying to find more resources or take a risk on something that then can give you the resources that you can reinvest, increase prize money, do more media, figure out ways to make prospect better. Um, and, you know, ultimately macro perspective, like that's pretty much what I'm trying to do. And we're probably going to fail a lot, but, you know, a couple of these things might hit. And some of these things, you know, are changes that, you know, are just making the decision to make it different. Um, and how that might have an impact on the way the sport could grow. Yeah, I I feel, I, I think I said it even on our first episode that like, I do, and I don't I don't know Jim very well, but I just I feel like you guys had such a, a juxtaposition when it comes to maybe some of the business sense or or some of the personality at least, and it it feels maybe like the more conservative person in that relationship is the person that's gone, and what's left is the very liberal, let's try things, let's do crazy stuff. Um, I, I, and, and it's so tough for me because I only had the outside perspective. I wasn't a, an FD insider, you know, beforehand, but I feel like, you know, Jim was instrumental in getting FD through some of the hardest times it's ever gone through. Oh, wait, COVID, like he, he seems like the kind of person who's just like, okay, this is what we need to do to survive. And you have been more of the person of like, this is what we need to do to grow to the next level. So I'm not saying you couldn't figure out during a shit situation, but it just, it seems like that was the dynamic. And now that the the more strategic and long-term planning person is no longer around, that's given you this, this realm to just 
just go and just try and be like, let's see what happens. Yeah. I mean, point of fact, there is no formula drift without Jim Lau. I mean, that is right. just, that, that is, is completely, um, a truism in the, in the realest sense of, of, of the word, because, you know, Jim was the one that kind of set things in the direction that we were going. And then I think the way you describe our relationship, the way I like to describe it is it's very much a yin and yang. You know, we had a, a nice counterbalancing effect. You know, I'm the person that you kind of more or less just described. And Jim is the one that says, Hey guys, let's be careful because here is here is the graveyard of all of these other entities from drag racing to these specialty de- events to novelty events that went out and spent way too much money and it looked really cool for about two years and then they buried themselves. And that philosophy of Jim still permeates in Formula Drift in a certain kind of way. I mean, that's the reason why I think we've made it to 20 years when everybody said that we couldn't make it past five. Um, but at the same time, I think when you get to be 20 years old, you know, you are now a mature adult. You have the right and probably the obligation to people that are supporting you to do things that are going to help you advance to the next level. And, and that might mean taking risks that get you in trouble if they don't hit in the first, second or third year. And, you know, that's the reality that I've had to face with, you know, my bosses, so to speak. Um, but, you know, it's, it's all worth it, I think, at the end of the day, if you want it to get to where I think it could go, where it is a possible world of drifting in the future, if you believe in that picture you have to do these kind of things. Whether you do them exactly my way or another way, you can't just keep doing the same thing year after year and expect naturally that all of a sudden it's going to grow into this huge behemoth. Um, there's so many natural constraints built into you know Formula Drift as it is anyways when you look at like the way we do our, our venue relationships and how, the, how big those events are and how we do our broadcasting and all that kind of stuff. But there, there is another place outside of where we are where if you look closely, you can kind of see the trajectory that we're trying to go on. And, you know, that's where we would like to get to. Yeah, it's the old adage of keep doing what you've always done and keep getting what you've always gotten, right? And right. I mean, it's had phenomenal organic growth. I mean, we sold out venues last year that, you know, faster than we ever have or for the first time or whatever. So it's it's getting there. But I I do understand the need for some sort of system-wide shock and what's interesting is with these rule changes and and basically a complete overhaul of what we know is you know quote unquote qualifying it's it's completely rippled through the entire industry which is crazy uh i did yeah. a really quick live stream just before this and somebody from um i think it was d1 uh, new zealand was like we're just gonna sit and watch and see what see what you guys do because we don't know and and that's like exciting and scary all at the same time that like the entire drifting industry is just sitting here going like, okay, let them try it. And if it works, we know what's going to happen next. And if it doesn't work, we can just keep doing what we've always done. Yeah. I mean, you know, my personality, I'm not one that likes to upset the apple cart unnecessarily, you know, to Mm -hmm. do something extreme for the sake of doing something extreme. Um, But, you know, you, there is a reason to evaluate what you're doing and say, you know, is this the best product that you can come up with? And, you know, that's the case for, you know, what you just talked about, but it's a case for a a lot of things as well. And, um, sometimes the answers are very, very clear on what you need to do. And other times it it takes a lot of thinking. Sometimes you knew the answer five years ago, but everybody had to mature up to a point where we say, Hey, you know, we tried X, Y, and Z the past couple, couple of years. Are you liking the outcome of this? And, you know, it's, it's not as if, like you said, that, um, you have to change the dynamics of, of the event weekends because, oh my gosh, you know, we're not selling out events anymore. Like we've never had any problems with that. In fact, you know, we've had to expand days to try and get more bodies in the door. And we have very few venues where, where we don't have some capacity limit. It's more about the organically, what the product is, what, what is formula drift in its essence? Um, the thing that we're presenting to fans, to sponsors, to brands that athletes are participating in. Um, and yes, you know, we're doing something very aggressive here. Um, but it's something that, you know, and we can get into this however you want to, but it's something that I think given us, given us our, where we're at, uh, when you look at how we're structured with pro and prospect, 
almost feels necessary. Um, I don't necessarily think that that applies to everybody else, whether you're talking about drift masters or guys that are running a solo championship where that's the main focus of things. And you can kind of control the elements of that a little bit more. When you've got two distinct series that have to run on the same weekends, and that doesn't seem to be inseparable at the moment, um, then all of a sudden the whole context changes. Yeah, it, it is a, I think for right now, it's a pretty specific use case, although there's obviously a lot of variables based on driver count, but I, I could see this qualifying system becoming a bit more difficult in event series where maybe driver registration is a little bit more in, in flux yeah. of the numbers or just which drivers are going to show up for which rounds or that kind of thing. So for, for the current situation, I think like, like any set of rules or regulations, like this is V1, this is... In, in, you know, the worst it's going to be is going to be the first year of this, where we're going to be like, oh, here's here's a bunch of situations we didn't even think of. I mean, last year, how many situations did we run into that never occurred in 20 years of of running FD? And, you know, we're up in the booth going like, how do we write a rule about this? Like, we've never experienced this. We've never seen this before. And, you know, how do we get this sorted? So when it comes down to this new system, I, I think it's it's ignorant to not think that it's going to happen. There's going to be something that happens that we have not thought of, um, which is crazy because the amount of discussion and internal discussion and external discussion about it, you would think the group, you know, the the group hive mind would have sorted all the problems already. <laughs> yes, uh, I mean, we've been talking about this for a long, long time, uh, and you there's a funny joke between like Kevin and I inside is that, you know, every time you make a rule change, uh, what you need to do is you need to figure out what entails from that logically, and then see if you find something down the line that bothers you so much that you have to prevent that from happening, even if it's low probability. Right. And so you just said all these things that don't seem like they would have happened, happened last year, whatever Murphy's law and all that kind of stuff. And that that's totally true. It always happens that way. Anytime you create a system, you're going to have multiple areas where there's going to be things going out that become possible in principle. And then whether or not they actually take place is just going to be a matter of circumstance. For sure, there's going to be some situation where people are going to be like, oh my gosh. But I think the, the benefit of what we have now is that that is going to be more of a story than a problem. Um, mm. The fact that, you know, Vaughn, for example, um, you know, and just stop me here if you want to get into this in a different kind of way, but Vaughn, for example, has earned his right in the top 24 for, for pro, for people that know what we're talking about. He, he's going to be slotted into that position in the main event top 32 on Saturday. Now, that number is going to correspond to a certain competitor that's going to come out of that seating bracket, right? And uh, that person is going to get a buy in the top 32. And some people might say, well, why did you do it like that? Why did you make it so that Vaughn got his automatic way into the top 32, even though you, that you knew that he wasn't going to be there? And these are some of the trade-offs that you have to make when you start running the modeling, because if you don't do it like that, what ends up happening is all of a sudden this top 16 goes from 16 drivers down to 12, down to 11, down to 10. And you don't run the buy, so you end up having like three or four battles instead of a full top 16. So because the driver variable in count, right, is, is always going to be in flux, but it's going to be much more constrained. Like we know people that are going to be coming in and out of events are Vaughn, LZ, um, Connor. You know, these people are not going to be doing all eight. They might be doing two, three, four. So you're going to have a little, you're going to have three person variable at any given event, depending on which ones they attend. If you had a set number of drivers in 32 or something like that, it makes everything so much easier. But because you don't, then you have to create systems that have more complexity to it. More complexity means more confusion. More confusion means more possibilities. And, you know, down and down you go. You know, I always tell people like, look, if you don't want to worry about, um, the things that we have to worry about now, just reduce the car count down to 24 for both series and everything will be perfect. But mm. resources will get, uh, obviously will get more concentrated over a small, smaller group of people. 
um, more people's programs will be better. Uh, everybody will be a little bit more, you know, I guess, cash rich in the moment uh, as they're getting those sponsorships and they're able, you know, to kind of take away from the people that are not participating, you know, the 36, 37, 38, nine drivers in pro and the, you know, 49 drivers or 47 pro, uh, drivers in prospect. But do you really, can you do that? Are you in a, are you ready to say right now, a year from now, two years from now, hey, the series no longer is a 32 car championship. Max drivers is 24. If you make it, great. If you don't, you don't. And then that's it. And so those people roll down into prospect. The prospect people roll down into pro am, and everything is much more focused, concentrated, like how it is in F1, for example. Um, that just feels wrong to me yeah. uh, in terms of like the effort that people have made that may not necessarily be winning every single weekend. But if you think about some of the guys that have sacrificed the shit out of their life to be in, uh, involved in this series, there's no way in hell I'm going to say, hey, so-and-so driver, if you don't make it uh, into the top 24, I guess we got to send you back down to prospect or, hey, prospect guy, we got to send you down to pro-am. I mean, that just seems wrong. Yeah, I, I know there's been a lot of conversation about that of taking, you know, potentially the bottom six and and rotating them or something like that. And I think it becomes difficult because there are... You know, take like a Dmitry Brutsky who, you know, could have gone into pro years ago and and won, was it three championships in, in yeah. pro spec? And it's like, you know, if that was the case, if that was the force, then you would have to force Dmitry Brutsky into pro and move down, you know, somebody else who who didn't do it. Like, I understand part of the reasoning behind it, but I think with this current setup and, and I mean, we can, we can jump into it right after this, if you want, I got, I got the screens already. So anybody who's listening, this is your chance now to <laughs> jump over to YouTube because it's going to get real visual real quick. Um, I, I do think with the, the current setup, when you and I spoke about it originally, the first thing I came up with is, oh, this is going to take our, our bottom tier drivers and provide them with an opportunity to shine and practice and get significantly better. And this is just going to shake up everything that we we thought we knew about these brackets. And that's the part that I'm interested in. And maybe three, four years down the road, if if we still see that those bottom six guys, the bottom six guys, then you know, we have a conversation at that point. But the way that this is built now with practice time and everything else, like this, I do firmly believe you're gonna find drivers that were bottom six over the last couple of years very quickly start to move their way up and drivers that we thought or that were in our top 24, you start to see them get knocked down a couple of pegs. Like, yeah. I don't want to give anybody the impression that like, oh, you know, there's, there's problems in FD that would be fixed if you did a driver account reduction. Uh, I mean, my personal opinion that I think like 40 is, is a sweet spot for both series. You yeah. know, we, the reason why we have, you know, so many drivers in prospect now is because we've had a lot of licenses that have been sitting on the outside that needed to get exercised. And we've kind of Kevin and I have spent the past three years really trying to grind into Pro-Am and figure out how do we get a perfect uh, mathematical cycle from people coming in and out of, of Pro-Am and Pro-Spec. And we're, we're finally there. But in this interim year, there's going to be more drivers than we typically would have, right? I think last year we were probably 42. Um, and so we added six more. We cannot go above 48. That's a hard stop. But I think in the, for the long term, 40 drivers per series feels kind of like a sweet spot to me. Um, and, you know, this is maybe going to confuse some people, but unless we went to a franchise based operation where spots were guaranteed and you received mm -hmm. a penalty for not coming to an event, you know, just like you know, Major League Baseball or uh, Formula One or name any of their franchise businesses, when you have an at will um, registration and you're qualified by, you know, getting your license. And all the formats that we've looked at, it feels like 40 is kind of like a sweet spot for, for both series to operate logistically, the amount of track, time on track, the current tire support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I could fill all that in. However, that has nothing to do, in my opinion, with the format that we're proposing now. I think that the format that we're proposing now, it's, it, it, you can't even compare it in terms of quality, conceptual quality, relative to our old qualifying system. I'm not comparing it to the two run non-consecutive qualifying system. I still think it smokes that, but our system that we had, that we had to basically uh, modify from the two run because of the nature of pro and prospect together any given weekends, I don't even think there's a close competition that it is a better product overall. And I think it will still 
prove to be merit based and people will understand it. And you're going to get, once we get into this and people understand the significance of this, it is going to change the entire dynamic of not just the events themselves, but in between the events when we find out what these battles are. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, without sounding like a typical person in a meeting, can you see my screen? All right. I can. Um, <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah. Let's for anybody listening. I know there's a lot of people that have been waiting on this and I don't know about you, but the amount of DMS that I've gotten of like, I think I understand it, but like, can you elaborate more? And I just, I kept pushing everybody. I'm like, just, there's going to be an episode with Sage and I, and we're going to go through this whole thing. So that's what this is now. It's your last chance for your audio only. You can still listen along, but it's going to make way, way more sense if you uh, jump over to YouTube and, and take a look. Yeah. So I think, um, you want me to just kind of jump into how I think the best way to tackle it is yeah. or, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So for those that are just coming to this for the very first time, um, we have gotten rid of single run qualifying. Single run qualifying is now in the history books. Formula Drift in its totality from the beginning to the podium is an all tandem competition. And the way that we have structured it is based upon the number of registrants per uh, series. Since all drivers register for the entire season, then we have uh, we already know what the registrants are for pro and prospect. So you have your on your screen up there. You have pro, and uh, there are three different formats. We'll talk about two of them because the third one is for thirty two drivers or less, which is unlikely to happen uh, this year for either series. But basically, what you get is and always think about it like this. Think about this as an exact replacement for qualifying in over the event weekend. So when qualifying happens on a Thursday or when qualifying happens on a Friday, in the case of either a combined weekend or a solo weekend, the time allocation that we have for qualifying gets replaced with this new format. So what Jacob has up on there, as you can see, there are um, 24 drivers that are colored in green. Those are the drivers that we call locked in. Okay, so they are locked in. Now, that's based off of the rankings from last year. Um, but moving forward after Long Beach, it will be based off of the event finish rankings for each particular round. And I can get into why that's important as we go along. So you can- As you opposed to season rankings, right? Like it's not, yep. it's not the whole season, like for halfway through the year, it is however you did last round, mechanical failure, whatever, that's, that's your seating. Yeah. And there will always be a way to make a distinction between drivers, even if they both got knocked out in the top 32 or they both got knocked out in the top 16. They may have the same number of points, but we will always have a way to make a distinction to separate them so that there is this version of event ranking at the end. And it's pretty okay. easy and intuitive if you understand. All you need to do is look at the number that's assigned to them right now. See that number okay. there? That's the way that Odie finished. Um, Obviously, Chelsea's not in, so Odie moves up. Yeah. But you basically have that assignment uh, moving into the main event top 32 bracket. So Odie is going to be acting as our number one qualifier. Matt Field is going to be acting as our number two qualifier and so on. And so we have 24 spots that are filled, right? Um, one through 24 in the main event bracket. The guys in white are the guys that are going into the seating bracket. So in the case of pro, the seating bracket is a top 16 from start to finish. And the reason why I make that distinction start to finish is because in pro spec, it's going to be a little bit different than that. Part of the consideration here is that we have a three and a half, four hour qualifying session in previous iterations. We need to have something similar in event time, event timing uh, in whatever format we propose. So a top 16 kind of gets us there uh, with regards to the pro series. So you take Adam LZ all the way down to Rudy Hansen, and uh, you put those guys into a seating bracket. And then we basically, the question is, well, how do you do that? Um, you want me to get into that? Yeah, might as well. Okay. So it's really, really, really important to understand that if we put those drivers, and so there you're seeing there the, the main event top 32 bracket, and the, the seeding numbers coming from those drivers that are going to be competing in that top 16 bracket. It's extremely important to remember that when you go into the seeding bracket, 
if all you did was place the athletes um, by their assigned number into that bracket. So Adam L, go to Adam LZ real quick up uh, above. Adam LZ is the first driver on there. He would be treated in the top 16 bracket as the number one qualifier with that logic, right? If we right. did that, if all we did was place Adam LZ in the number one spot and Diego in the number two spot and Jeff Jones in the number three spot, what would happen is that because any of those drivers would potentially be knocked out uh, in the, that position or whatever, you will not have much variance in who they compete in the seating bracket if they are knocked out in that seating bracket for the remainder of the season. So you need to have a slight variable. This is something that we adopted during COVID that sorts the order, but still keeps it more or less the same so that you don't get the same guys facing each other throughout the entirety of the year. So for a, for a pro bracket, the sorting number is two through seven. That's the only quote unquote random part of this. Um, and I'll show you the way that you do it. Go back up to the, to the Adam part. Okay, so now put your finger on Adam. That's your number one guy. Now, if we draw, and well, the way that we'll do this, this is kind of cool. Kevin made these for me. The way we'll do this out on the event is we'll do it all on the podium. And we, we have these oh, little... Cool. We'll put these in a bag and we'll let the winner of whatever championship pick it out of there. So that way it's all public. It's totally above board. People are not going to be freaking out being like, oh my gosh, Formula Drift, you know, they, they you know, assigned it behind the doors or whatever. Um, they'll pick that number out. Now let's, let's say you pick number two, right? Um, so number two, how it works is you count down from Adam LZ. Adam LZ is one. Diego Higa is number two. That means Diego Higa becomes the number one qualifier in the top 16 bracket. LZ goes to the bottom and everybody sorts up one Shifts position. Up. Right. If it's number three, we go, or let's say, let's go extreme. Let's go number seven, right? Adam is one. Diego is two. Jeff is three. Joao is four. Ryan Literal is five. Mike Power is six. Kyle Mohan is seven. Kyle Mohan is now your number one qualifier. Everybody above Kyle goes to the bottom in that order. And so you get essentially a, a variance of battles that could take place. And you really do need this. Um, it, it's, I don't want to get into too much of the complexity, but when we ran the modeling where you had a one um, or a, even worse eight as a number, if you go higher than seven, what ends up happening is the same guys face each other all season long if they get knocked out in that bracket. If you go eight, what ends up happening is it just inverts. So nothing changes. So you, you have a position change of between two and seven that allows you to have a sort so that you're still battling your peers. And remember, this is going to be event finish moving forward. So it's not as if the number one guy is going to come in and face these guys. These guys are all guys that have finished in the relative position at any particular round. And it should, in theory, be competitively similar to how they're doing at any part of the season. So, you know, that's the way that we will kind of sort the bracket. And, I, you know, I don't know at what point, but everybody will be very excited to know that we're going to sort the first bracket for, for Long Beach on the podcast tonight, uh, which is really exciting. And I, yeah. I have a way to do it so that nobody thinks we're doing any trickery or anything. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we will be able to tell you right now, um, you know, on this podcast, what the seating bracket is for Long Beach. And since you already know, how we stipulate the top 24. Now you've got the, the main event top 32 bracket set with those top 24 drivers. So I said a lot there. Let me just have you digest that and, and, you know, come back to me with some questions or clarifications or whatever. Yeah. So essentially this seating bracket section is going to be, um, more or less its own set of separate battles that are going to take place on qualifying day. Uh, and all that we're doing by picking out this number is figuring out what that order is going to be. So these drivers are basically into the next day. Uh, they, they don't have to run through this, this seating set of qualifying battles. They're ready to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, th and that is based solely on the event before. Since this is the first year, the event before is essentially the season before. And that is that is where this comes in. Right. So, and I, I think um, it's important. Yeah. I think it's important to kind of note, like, um, if you're a fan watching the broadcast or if you're a fan at the live event, like what's the difference that in you that you would experience? Well, 
it's pretty easy to understand that the main difference is that instead of single rung qualifying, you're going to get this, what I think is a, an amazing top 16 bracket where mm-hmm. eight, the eight winners are going to be, after they get sorted through that bracket, are going to be slotted into the top 32 main event. You're not, you're going to have that instead of single run qualifying plus, you know, the, you know, the 25 through whatever for in the old system or whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're nothing else is going to change. All of the same practice is going to occur. All of the top drivers are still going to be doing that practice with each other in the exact same way. But what is going to change, which I think is going to be a huge, huge thing for us to take a look at is right now, if you're somebody that is really focusing on a two setup weekend, a qualifying setup and a tandem setup, when you do your qualifying setup, most guys are using a single set of rears. There's no reason to run a set of rears on one lap and then go back out and do it again on those same set of rears because you're not mimicking what's going on in reality. Now, some people may. Some people may because they're trying to be budget conscious or whatever, but for most guys, they are using one set of rears. So now what's going to happen over the course of the season, in aggregate, tire consumption is most likely going to go down because you take 40, 39 drivers and then you say, oh, if I'm going to do 12 laps, that means it's six, uh, six tires, right? Uh, instead of 12 or more, depending on how many laps they were doing a you know, qualifying setup, and then multiply that over the course of the season. From the moment they get to the event, they will be in the tandem mind frame. You know, Matt Field told me, he's like, I go from a mental psychological perspective of qualifying and then a delineation and then to tandem because I'm trying to get those championship points. I'm trying to get that best possible position. If you told me that now all I need to do is focus on tandem, the whole world has changed for me as an athlete. My entire weekend is predicated around trying to do the best I possibly can. Now let's go, let's go a level deeper. What else happened? Well, after tonight and after every single round, you're going to know who you're going up against in the seating battle for for two weeks, for three weeks. You're going to know the winning percentage of that person that you're going up against. You're going to get on the sim and you're going to do road Atlanta and you're going to try to figure out that driver's tendencies. You're going to watch videotape and you're going to say, oh my gosh. Diego Higa lifts right here, but he's really on throttle right here. And he's got huge angle in here. What the hell is that going to do to the sport? That yeah. to me is unbelievable. It's it, you get to watch game tape, like, you, like, like almost any other sport where, you know, coming up who you're going against, you get to go watch game tape, especially, and, and where this is the most effective is with these drivers that have, tr- that are traditionally, you know, landing in this, you know, 25 and down slot. Right. And, and that's getting back to like my point previous, that's the part that I'm most excited about is all that this is doing is taking drivers that need more time, like rookies, like let's, let's, let's put it into rookies, right? You take a Derek Madison, this gives Derek more time to tandem, right? It gives him one setup to focus on. He doesn't have to worry about, uh, I mean, a, a good example is like, if you've ever watched practice, Practice before qualifying has one massive lead line of drivers trying to line up and almost nobody in the chase line. Yeah. And it makes practice take forever. Yep. And it's this, it's for lack of a better term, it's kind of a shit show. You're not <laughs> going to have that now. Mm-hmm. You're going to have drivers who are tandeming for or following first in the follow line almost exclusively and drivers who are leading first in the lead line. And then, you know, they're going to then swap because they're going to have half used tires. They get to know ahead of time what they're doing, how to set up the car and build a setup specific to that. And and even for the top tier drivers, they know, oh, I'm going to lead every, like I'm, I'm top three guys. I'm probably going to lead first every single run. So now I can develop my car to not eat through so much on my lead. So I have more for the chase. Like this is going to bring in like a meta into the sport that we've never seen before. And like those little strategy and setup things are like what that that's, that's, that's what gets me so pumped about this. There's a domain where that obviously plays a huge role. Um, and then when you think about like what is going to be different for drivers on a substance level in terms of driving, if you're somebody that's always fighting for a championship, if you're an Osbo, a Dean, a Matt field, an Odie or whatever, what changes for you? Oh, you do one less lap. 
where you pushed at 92%, you know, like maybe Chelsea is the one that's doing 110% because he just doesn't care and he's trying to go crazy and, you know, mad respect to him. But I know for a fact from talking to drivers that they tell me it doesn't make sense for me to go 110% in qualifying because right. if, if I miss that run, I'm screwed. And, you know, because then I can't predict where I'm, who I'm going to go up against. I might end up in 25th. I might end up in 32nd. If I end up in 32nd, I'm screwed because I got Odie, right? So everybody is playing this kind of like very mediocre, you know, pushing as much as they can, but not too much thing in the old form of qualifying. And so you're going to miss that from Osbo. You're going to miss a mediocre run from Frederick Osbo. However, everything else that he does during the weekend still applies. He's going to run through his top 32, 16, eight, whatever, however far he gets in competition. But Dan Burkett might be the star of the seated bracket weekend because now he's got a 16, eight, four final. Four battles on screen, creating value for sponsors, mm -hmm. for brands. If his weekend ends there, if he gets knocked down the top 32 the next day, that's a, that's a massive win for him, right? Because it's not, we all know that in this game, results are important. They are so much less than the value that you create through other means, through media development and, you know, creating content and things like that. If you stand on top of that, and we will do that, we'll do a first, second, and third, like we do traditionally for that seating uh, bracket. <clears throat> That's a massive win for you, no matter what happens to you throughout the remainder of the weekend. And to your point, it actually is going to make them better drivers. And you know, not to deviate too much from pro, there are drivers in ProSpec right now that have not done a tandem run. Right. That, that, yeah. that, now that's impossible. Every driver in ProSpec has to do tandem. Yeah. And, and there are plenty of drivers who, frankly, choke in qualifying, but given the correct pairing, absolutely crush in tandem. There, there are drivers who are, you know, if, if you look at it, even from like the MMA perspective, they are chase drivers. That is what they're phenomenal at. That's how they win their battles. But you look at qualifying and they, they choke and sometimes they don't even make it to the show. But then you watch and you like, you watch their highlight reels and you go, oh, in tandem though, this, this driver is just going to adore everybody. Well, now we get to see that part of their ability on display and that, and the drivers who are really good at quote unquote qualifying, they're leading anyways. So show me your perfect qualifying. You just happen to have a chase car behind you. Yeah. So I, I do think it, it allows it, I mean, it just opens up so much and, and possibilities wise, like, um, you know, I've known about this for a number of weeks and I've just been like floating through like what last season would have looked like. Like well, I, think about I, I simulated last season. It was crazy. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah, it was wild. Like how different it would have been. So, think, I mean, think about it from like your, you know, your your domain, which is obviously not any one domain. But think about it from a marketing perspective too, right? Yeah. Like that's the way I'm. I think about this as well because that's kind of my background. Um, you know, when you leave an event, you talk about the event. You know, you celebrate the winner. Some videos come out. People are telling stories. You get some background content. There's some cool stuff that comes out. Buys you that time between round three and four or whatever the case may be. When round three is over, I'm going to be able to give you a versus graphic from driver A and driver B in the seated bracket that people can yeah. talk about, right? I can tell you the winning percentages and I can do that for every driver. So every driver that you know is trying their best to create as much value as they can and they just try to, they keep repurposing that qualifying clip that we, that we give them to use or those GoPro clips that we give them to use. Now we can do so much more than that because we're building anticipation to that point. We can put out essentially boxing hero cards or, you know, lineup matches talking about these battles in, in the seated competition. And then people can also see, ah, if, you know, if Dmitry Brutsky wins his top 16, but gets knocked out in the great eight, that means he's going to be going up against so-and-so in, you know, the main event top 32 bracket. Cause it's, it's all known. It will all be known. Yeah. Yeah. We'll be able to, yeah, you can, you can fantasize about your bracket literally the day after the other event runs. So yeah. you're going to, you're going to pull that chip like on the podium, whoever wins, that's the person who's going to pull the chip for the next round. I, I want to, I mean, I, I, that's the way I think like I, you want to do it in a transparent way. I mean, during right. co during COVID, 
we had no option but to do it in the driver's meetings. Um, right. And then after a while, like the drivers got bored of doing it. So we just had Kevin, you know, do it randomly with a random sort, <laughs> with a random number gen- generator that he made. And, you know, that's fine and everything, but we're not in the COVID period now. We're, we're in the like, hey, you know, we're doing something what we think is super dynamic and crazy, and it's probably going to be nuts and wild, and there's probably going to be huge ups and downs, but we think it's a much, much better product. What's the best way to create hype for this? Well, I think, you know, you do it at the end of the event. You take the event winner, whether it's pro or prospect, you give them a nice little formula drift hat or a satchel or something on there, and you say, pull this thing out of there, and he fumbles around, and boom, there you go. There you go. You yeah. got your, your, that number right there. We'll tell you. I'm trying to see. It's all, it's white on white background. There goes my red Smart. face. You, um, you know, that right there will tell you what your bracket is. Yeah. I mean, if you have a better idea, I'm happy. I would love to hear no. it. I just, I, I just, I like it. I don't know how else to do it um, without it seeming like, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> what's the word? Um, you know, yeah, you being, de- be being decided ahead of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just tra- random and transparent is what yeah. we want. So, well, can we uh, can we run through and explain? Because like, depending on the driver count, there's going to be a couple of different situations, right? Because mm-hmm. um, I know there's a bunch of people right now thinking like, well, what if there's only this many or that many? Like, I think that's probably the next logical step to to run through and explain what these scenarios could look like. Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, okay, so this is this would be your quote unquote your top thirty two. So this is what would come after the seating bracket where people would sit based on their ranking coming out of this, the seating battles. If we, we, we got to find a name. I know Jared's going to come up with something uh, at some point in time, but I think seating battles or qualifying battles or something along those lines. Yeah, no, I think what we're going with is it's the, there's the seating bracket and then there's a main event top 32. So the main event top 32 is not too far away from, uh, you know, the, like the nomenclature that we've been using. And the seating bracket um, gets rid of the word qualifying because I think that's a dead term now. I think if we used qualifying in some way, um, qualifying for us as we've defined it in rule books in the past is about single run. So I wanted to get rid of that term altogether so there's no confusion. Seating bracket just feels like the, the right term at the moment. And it tells you that it's not the final. It tells you that this is something that's going to transpire that then seeds the main event bracket. Right. I feel like I feel like there's a word we're like missing. I don't want to use like playoffs or shootout or any of the, <laughs> the, the terms that everyone else is using. Well, there's it's some not, we're missing. There's like a sport. It's there's not set in stone. We can do V ones, V twos. You know, we can figure uh, it out. I what, we'll we'll read the comments after. Uh, okay, seating bracket number two drawn. So this is this is essentially what it would look like if you drew the number two. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is referencing back to this list. So in this case, Diego Higa, right, right, would be our our first slot, our first seed, if you will. Yep. And this is what that bracket would look like because Adam was above him. He would mm-hmm. actually get pushed up and then back down, you know, kind of like the old side scrollers. You go from one side into the other. Ooh, there's some deadly battles in there I just saw. Right? So like oh. Ben Hobson, Connor Shanahan oh. right off the bat. Holy shit. So I know I, you, you sent me this earlier and I've like, I've run through it. I'm just like, oh my God. Like, anyways. Look, you have to, okay. There's one thing you have to bear in mind from a purely like, uh, you know, we're both psycho weirdos in drifting. Like, you know, we can't sleep thinking about this, that, whatever, yeah. da, 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 da. As of yesterday, there was one open spot in this bracket, right? Right. Because Connor hadn't registered. And right. so, you know, I, I'll just tell that story real quick if you want me to. Um, you know, yeah. bas- basically, we closed registration a long time ago. And um, the reason that we do that is not just for this format. There's so many other things that are, that, you know, that, that that is dictated from from you know how we're going to set up pit spaces to making sure we're printing all the door cards and the number placards and making sure all the patches are getting out to the right people and making sure we're getting all the right signatures on the right documents and all that kind of all takes time there's logistics there's real estate space all that kind of stuff so we we need to like have a cutoff and then get people registered and move forward because we are we are we don't have any single event registration everything is season long registration tell you about why that is if you want to but um, that's the way that, that the series currently operates. So when we right. got to the end, um, you know, there was a couple guys, one of them, 
Connor asked for an extension. He was trying to figure out what to do. He really, really wanted you know, to come and compete this year. And he wanted to do it in a certain kind of way. It felt to me as if though it was the flame was starting to subside, like maybe some of the conversations he were he was having were, was not necessarily going in the right direction. And look, you know, it's not a huge financial commitment on the registration side, and we would give him the money back if he didn't make it. Everything else is what the commitment is, right? The commitment is <laughs> yeah. being on the road and traveling and paying people and all that kind of stuff. So yesterday I'm like sitting at home you know, on the couch or whatever. And I get like a messenger from him and he's like, Hey, is there any way that I could still register? Now, bear in mind, I'd sent you these documents right on Friday. You know, Kevin made them, we sent them to you. Let's get them ready for the podcast, et cetera, et cetera, the whole nine. Um, and that's going to be happening in 24 hours. We've already pushed this podcast a week for, uh, for other reasons, but that's going to be happening 24 hours. So I told him, I said, Honestly, you know, you did ask for the extension. The extension is still there. Technically, when we put out this seating bracket on Monday, that's when we basically can't add anybody else, right? So you need to get approval from Kevin um, that the extension is going to be honored. You, then you need to register with Cassidy and you need to do all that by 12 o'clock on Monday. And he's like, I'm seeing all the little dots. <laughs> Then all of a sudden, Kevin calls me. Kevin's like, Connor's back in? And I'm like, <laughs> uh, I'm like, I didn't know if Kevin was mad, you know, because like, I don't know if, you know, sometimes I think Kevin thinks that I do stuff with talking to people and then it upsets the apple cart for him or whatever. But he was so pumped up. He was super stoked. And I was like, yeah, this is what's going on. Da, 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 whatever. Honestly, within 12 hours. They had everything done. I'm not going to say anything about his program because it's not it's not for me to say. I'm let the team do he'll it. Get his, he'll get his own episode for that. Yeah. So yeah, and you, you know you guys will have fun with that. But literally on Sunday night, the night that I'm preparing for aspects of this podcast by delivering you the paperwork that break down all these seating brackets, I had to call you. And then what did I say? I said, "Hey, <laughs> throw all that shit away. <laughs> it's yeah. got to start over again." Yeah. It was basically, are you sitting down? I have something to tell you. And I'm like, oh God. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's the best, best possible problem to have. That's how I look at but it. But I think the reason why that's relevant is because with Connor not in, there was one open spot in this top 16. That's, right. that's, that's the key point there. And now it's a full top 16. Yeah. So essentially, you know, practice, everything else over the weekend is going to be relatively the same. I know there's a couple of like small adjustments here or there, but like what would happen then during what would normally be our qualifying spot is we get these battles, which people will know about. Uh, well, I mean, after this episode, they're going to know exactly what this looks like. This is just a, a demo version of it. This isn't the actual bracket yet. Just hang tight for that. Um, and we would essentially run battles as if it was any other set of battles, right? So he got LZ, Hobson, Shanahan, literal Federico, you know, list goes on. So in this scenario, uh, we have everybody out at, at Long Beach. How does this then play into our top 32 bracket? How does, what happens in this scenario and how does that then seed into our top 32? Okay, so lowest common denominator understanding of how to think about this is Anybody that wins their battle in the top 16 is guaranteed a spot in the top 32. Why? Because we take, we have uh, 32 open spots, right? We have 24 that are already slotted in from the seated drivers or the locked in drivers. And, and so we have eight spots available. 16 drivers in here, uh, eight drivers get eliminated, eight drivers are left. Those eight drivers are automatically guaranteed a spot uh, into the top 32. What happens after they win that battle is the remainder of the bracket becomes a sorting mechanism, okay. right? So if they win, then they would be the 25th guy, right? If they're second, they'd be the 26th guy, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a benefit. And, and look, we're, there's other things we can talk about that is kind of interesting, but it's, you know, it, I'm sure it will come up at some point this year. There's a benefit to going as far as you possibly can. Not, no, not just from a media value standpoint, but also from a positioning standpoint. Now, right. what could get interesting is you could say, huh, 25 is going up against, let's, let's see, let's just do, let's mess around with this real quick. Uh, 25 is going up against, let's find the driver. Who is it? I was just looking. 25, is, oh, it shows seating to be up against. 
Okay, eight, Dylan, Hughes. Dylan Hughes. Okay, so now imagine, you know, you're in the finals. And if you win, you're going up against Dylan Hughes. And if you lose, you're 26, you're going up against uh, Forsberg. And let's just mm. say you've never, 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 never beat Dylan Hughes, but you have beat Chris or something like that, right? What happens? What do you do? Could You could throw the battle. I don't think people are going to do that, but I'm just being, so either. <laughs> I, I'm being, I'm being as transparent as possible right. with what happens when you have all knowledge of what your what the future holds for you. Right. Um, and you know, you might, you might take a look at that and say, huh, I don't think any of our drivers would, but conceptually you can imagine a situation where, and it could be in an earlier part of the bracket too. Like if you got knocked out in the final four, where there may be an advantage for you because you've never lost to one guy, but you've lost to the other, what you do in those situations. Um, I'm not trying to make a big deal about that, that people are actually going to do that. I actually think you're going to get grinded if you do do that. You know, if it appears that you're throwing a battle for a position, it's a, it's a totally bad marketing 101. No, no, you're going to go yeah. out there and crush it. I mean, I think that's what they're going to do, but it's just interesting to think about. The, the court of public opinion is what's going to, is going to get you right. <laughs> yeah. Cause like, that's it. That's what'll end up happening. I mean, uh, the NHL is running into a, has run into a similar issue where it was once teams were eliminated from the playoffs, they would just tank because then they got a better draft pick. So then they put in a lottery ah, to ah. help preserve that, preserve that. What's is a total sidebar, but interesting. The, uh, PWHL, uh, professional women's hockey league, which is phenomenal, arguably better than the NHL. I know some people are going to get mad at me for that. What they do now is the moment you are mathematically eliminated from the playoffs, you're, you now start collecting extra points. And whatever team has the most extra points after being mathematically eliminated is who gets the first draft pick. So you are incentivized to win games after you're knocked out of the playoffs. Mm. Mm. So if you get knocked out earlier, you collect more points. So it, it stops teams from just tanking to try and get a better draft pick. Cause it's like, I know I, I, I believe it's a similar thing in baseball. Like it's annoying to watch. And I've, as a Leafs fan, I've unfortunately had to watch it. Uh, yeah. It's just like an interesting way that they, they went around this. I don't think in this case, people are going to tank on purpose. I think what it will do though, is like bring up a lot of rumors about people potentially doing it, which would then incentivize drivers to drive even harder to prove that that's not what they're doing. Well, I think one of the things that um, when you start thinking it through, I just I, I just remember this from a conversation with Kevin is that, you know, the the number that gets assigned to you, right, 25, 26, 27, you know, depending on how you do in that competition, you're going to ride that all the way through the top 32. And that number right. is going to play a role in where you situate yourself in the top 24 when people both get knocked out in the top 16. They have equal number of points, but over here is a 25 and over here is a 32. Now you've got a distinction. And if that happens to be, have you fall into the top 24, then there's a benefit for you there. So if you make a decision earlier in competition, you know, for whatever reason, and it ends up playing a negative impact later on in the top 32, you might be kicking yourself if you were thinking about going that direction. Well, it also gives you the ability to um, lead first, need be like, I mean, it, there, there's some other benefits that go with it. Um, plus, plus points, right? Like yeah. just total season points. So I don't, that's such a massive risk. I mean, I know we saw RTR do it a little bit where they were like, quote unquote, like tanking, qualifying to seed lower to battle differently. Um, I don't know if they ever like admitted to it, but it definitely seemed like the case, but like, I'd have to go through and check those battles to see if it even worked out for them. No, I mean, I think it was pretty uh, clear that they were, you know, strategically trying to, you know, position themselves because positioning became better because there was no points at that time, which right. I mean, from a, like a strict logical perspective actually makes sense. Um, yeah. But that's why you have to put the incentive structure back in. And so that's, we resolved that. But, you know, at the end of the day, like in my personal opinion, I just feel like that the qualifying that we were doing, unless we could go back to two run qualifying, which we can't, physically impossible to do it, you have to have something that is better than what we have now. And, you know, what's better than more tandem? Yeah, exactly. I mean, 
honestly, just look at like the viewership rates of of what qualifying oh, was. I, yeah, I, it's not even when, close. When you and I were talking about the podcast, like how many listeners do you think you're going to get? I'm like, off the bat, it'll be the same people that watch all the qualifying because it's those diehard super fans. <laughs> Dude. Like that's, that's, I mean, it was within a Delta of like 5%. So I was pretty happy I nailed that number. But I do think it, one for anybody who's just buying like a one day ticket, you're going to get a much better show. Um, yep. People argue with me and say that watching single run perfection was incredible. And I don't disagree. I, there's going to be parts of me that miss like the hundred point JTPs or the crazy, oh my God, Frederick Osbo spun out in qualifying. Like we're going to get moments. They're just not going to be the moments that we had. That's mm-hmm. it. That's, that's the difference. You're going to, with this, you're going to see situations where drivers that you didn't expect to just decimate come in and do that. And you're also going to see situations where in Long Beach, let's say a uh, Frederick Osbo crashes out in top 32 or for whatever reason is now seated low has to go up against a hero Minoa right off yeah. the bat. Like if, Fr- if uh, Freddie wants to win a championship, he's got to take out a hero Minoa or a Connor Shanahan or whoever <laughs> in top 32 right off the bat. And he's got to sit on that yeah. from that, from that, you know, announcement all the way to that event. Yeah. Like, Oh, mind games. It's going to be crazy. It, it, it is. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I think, um, you know, the stuff that you said about JTP and, you know, Tanner hundred point run and all that, you know, you, yes, you're going to sacrifice that, but we sacrificed that a long time ago, because if you think that prospect is a reasonable and a worthwhile endeavor to pursue, to have something that you assimilate to from pro-am and then from that into pro which I personally think is absolutely 100% necessary because the gap between pro and prime is way too hard, then you cannot have two run qualifying. If you cannot have two run qualifying, you have a number of different options that you can pursue in the qualifying realm, you know? Um, and we've tried all of them. We've tried, and not I wouldn't say all of them. We've tried every version of something that what we thought was compelling enough. And by the way, Everybody mostly bitches about the scores in qualifying anyways. Why did that guy get a, <laughs> you know, 92.1? And why did I get, right. you know, a, 90, a, a 90.8? You know, I had a better, you know, corner over here or something like that. I had more angle over here. And, you know, everybody understands that. And it, it's the thing that people put a lot of weight into because, you know, you can, you, that's really what you can scrutinize. It's so much. It's so much more fun to be able to do that and scrutinize it in tandem, where you can actually really have a discussion about why driver A or driver B won in real time, when you can see them both on the screen and make that comparison. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, well, let's take a look at some potential other situations. So this is based solely off driver count, um, because that's the next part. People are going to be talking about, like, well, what happens if you know Adams out of every event, or Vaughn's out of every event, or you know Connor can't make it to this event or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is well, this one's breaking down what the bracket would look like if number three was drawn. Yeah. Um, so what you what you have here, if you're going down the list, is basically it's just breaking down what the bracket's going to look like if you draw two, three, four, five, six, or seven. So right. that's that's going to line up. The, so tonight, one of those is going to become reality. And obviously so we'll be we'll, able to flip back to this and, and be like, this is, this is it. This is the seating bracket that yep. you're going to see in Long Beach. Yep. And we're recording Crazy. this and there's no getting away from it. No, no, we're, we're committed <laughs> now. All right. Well, let's, uh, I think we come back to, to this. Okay. Um, maybe we'll leave, we'll leave the end near the end of the show for that. I'm going to keep that Ooh. retention rate nice and high. All right. All right. Um, so what, what, what ends up happening if we do have less drivers, if we have, I'm assuming if we have top 32, if we only have 32 drivers, we just run 32. Is it one of those, like, once we get to a certain point, we just do a, a top? Like, I, I, I'm curious, like, where the threshold is. So, if, okay, so uh, you have, there's three systems, 32 and below, 31 right. to 40, 41 to 48. 41 to 48 is prospect. Theirs will be, instead of a top 16 bracket run all the way through, it will be a single run in a top 32 bracket or a single battle in the top 32 bracket. So Got even it. for them, tire consumption is actually way less because the, the equivalence of doing that battle is the same as doing a qualifying run, right? In terms of tire usage. So the top 16 or the 16 winners from that bracket will then go into the top 32 meeting the 16 locked drivers. And so the lock, what you lock driver account as 
depends upon the the number of drivers that are registered or or at an event like if we have some you know fall off or something like that. The one that we're talking about right now is what Pro is currently situated at. Pro is currently situated, I think, at like anywhere between 37 to 39 drivers with the addition of Connor. And you have like guys like LZ and Vaughn who are going to be doing selected events. So some rounds, you're going to have more drivers than others, but it's always going to be, uh, at least in right now, it's going to be above 32. So you're going to have this top 16 bracket. If it's 32 or below, same thing like qualifying. Nobody's going home except for you're going to have a great eight bracket from start to finish that just becomes a sorting mechanism. That's okay. it. Got it. So, so 24 seated, and then you take the remaining drivers for that grade eight. They do that. And then the winner obviously has the best position. Second place has the second best position and so on. Okay. And, and drivers missing around obviously go to the bottom of that. So in these situations where a driver may not be competing throughout the whole series, they immediately go down and then they've got to fight their way back up anyways. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know exactly what rounds Vaughn is going to drive this year, but I know enough to know that he's not going to drive two consecutive rounds. So he will always be going into this bracket. I, I don't, I don't know <laughs> what rounds LZ is going to drive this year, but I know enough to know that he's not driving two consecutive rounds. He will always be in that bracket because he started in that bracket in, in, uh, in Long Beach. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, I don't know exactly what his schedule looks like, but even if Vaughn ran Long Beach, that would be the only situation where he would be in the locked in scenario. Hmm. Okay. And then obviously if he's within the locked in, doesn't show up, then we just shift the bracket a little bit. And then I guess the only weird side with this is that somebody, at least in Long Beach, may get a buy into out of seating based solely on luck, right? Yeah. So let's take the Vaughn example. We kind of touched on it a little bit, but it's a, it's a real life scenario. So um, assume Vaughn doesn't show up to Long Beach. He's got other ideas of what events he wants to do, right? Um, now he has ownership of that position. I think he's 18th. I don't know. We could look that up, but I think, I think he's 18th right now, um, which is pretty damn good for doing whatever two events. Uh, let's see. <laughs> I think it was four. Uh, Vaughn's 22nd. 22nd. Okay. So he's 22nd. Yeah. So he's right at the cusp there. He owns 22. He has taken ownership of that number. He gets that number going into Long Beach. So what's going to happen is we're going to seed him or lock him in to the top 24. He's going to be in the 22nd position. When the event comes, we're not going to say, oh, Vaughn's on here. We're going to kick you out. No, but he get he owns that spot. Then uh -huh. as the seated driver goes to compete against him, and he's not there, that person will get a buy in the top 32 because Vaughn's not there. The okay. re, the so a reason, similar situation if, if there was a mechanical and somebody couldn't come to the line, it's the, it's the same idea. It, it, it's so that we don't have to create a new bracket. It, there's a lot of reasons for it, but one of, the, one of the primary reasons is how many times has there been an event that started where a driver didn't make it to the line but was there at the event, right? They, right. they blew out their, their car in practice or... You know, they yeah. crashed into a wall or whatever the case may be. And there's an open spot in top 32. If you go with the prior logic of filling in as people um, move out, then we have to make a new bracket every time. It makes this whole idea of knowing from, with certainty moving forward between rounds pointless because somebody might not show up or they might show up and crash out. And then we have to make an adjustment. So once you take ownership of an event ranking finish, that's yours until the event is over. Okay. Got it. Hmm. That'll make, that'll make things spicy. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. I mean, I, <laughs> I, like I said, I've, I've run through these scenarios. I don't know how many times and I I've yet to find something that's glaring and, and I kind of hope somebody brings something up that's glaring that maybe we've missed. Cause I think it's the only time, the only way we're going to be able to fix or look ahead or prepare for it. Like, you know, when you're doing something this bold, you 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 have to be prepared to take notes and adjust. And oh, I dude! Like I mean, this is mo yeah. this is version like twenty five. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Because you know, so do you want the background to this? Like how? Yeah, why might why, as well. why did this happen? So you know, um, I do these quarterly calls with the teams. Uh, it's something I started when I started doing this. Like communication is really important for me, you know. And I know that there are drivers and athletes out there that are just they don't like to talk. 
maybe they might want to talk in a private setting, but they don't necessarily like to raise their hand in driver's meetings or whatever. Um, but they want their voice to be heard. And other drivers are like really loud and big and like they take control of the room and it's just like, ah, you know, and then the people that are not like that are, you know, will complain about those people like, oh, so-and-so is always, you know, why do you always listen to him? And why is he the one taking control of the environment? So my thought was, okay, well, how do I allow myself to be available to everybody equally? Okay. So the first thing we'll do is we'll do these quarterly calls, just like a, you know, fortune 500 company or whatever, like, you know, here's our earnings and this and that, da, 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 da. And what I do on those calls is I basically talk about what things are going on in the series at that particular time. So like quarter one is like what to expect for the year. Quarter two is, hey, how's everything going? Quarter three is like, hey, guys, here's here's the events for the upcoming season. And here's some of the things, the challenges that we're having, what we're planning on doing at SEMA, blah, blah, blah. Um, and it's just a way for there to be an open dialogue, two-hour conversation, this and that, da, 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 da. Um, at the end of the year, we do a driver summit uh, and we do it at uh, at Irwindale on Wednesday. And it's like, whatever, last year, I think we went like four hours. And it's just basically like, throw out whatever you have uh, to talk about. And I have an agenda. I go through my agenda. I talk about where I think the series is. I do like a state of formula drift type thing. Um, and then we talk about you know some of the things and challenges that we want to do. Where do we want to invest money? What are some of the problems that we're having? How much it is, is it related to like competition structure or judging or like broadcast or distribution or whatever the case may be? Um, and last year, basically, the the drivers essentially challenged us. You know, they had challenged us to try to figure out a better way to structure competition. And it always came back to qualifying. How do we fix qualifying? Going back to 2020, you know, 20, I don't know, 15, 14, I think I counted, we did, we've done like 12 different qualifying formats, you know, different variations, starting top to bottom, bottom to top, bottom right. eight. 25, you know, 24 locked in and then the rest and whatever, all of them. I mean, let's be honest, all of them sucked. Um, in my opinion, right. And like, it's my product, you know, it's my, it's our product here in the, in this office. Like we need to be proud of what we do. And I just wasn't proud of what we were doing. And the drivers were straight up telling us that they're not proud of it, that it, it's, it's too nuanced, you know, um, it's hard to understand, uh, it doesn't really push the limits. I'm going at a, you know, a much more moderate rate than I would if it was two run qualifying. Oh, and we understand why, because we can never go back to two run qualifying. So we're kind of stuck, you know, in this weird position. So they challenged us and said, how do we fix it? And one of the things we talked about, is there a way to do something with just all tandem? So Kevin and I left that meeting and over the course of the holidays, we said, all right, here, what are the, if we had to design, design something, what would be the things that we would have to like package into this for it to make sense? All right. First of all, it's gotta be the same relative time, right? Can't be more, can't be more time because then we're really screwed. Yeah. Um, and the tire consumption has to be more or less the same. Take those two constraints. And what you'll find is if you're trying to do an all tandem competition, it will narrow down things very, very quickly. And so you know, we started talking to drivers about the reality of this. I'm, I originally was an advocate of, of announcing it now, but doing it in 25. You know, Kevin was just like, don't be a pussy. Like, just do, you know, you really got to just bite this thing off because we just ended the 20th season, right? You're turning over a new leaf. There's no reason not to do this. This is Kevin talking to me. And, yeah. you know, I kind of came around to that, you know, and I, I, I agreed with him and I'm glad that he, he pushed me. Um, and we start talking to drivers. I talked to Vaughn, I talked to Ryan Literal, talked to Taylor Hole, talked to Matt Field, talked to Frederick Osbo, talked to Steph, explaining it. You know, everybody's kind of lost at the beginning and then slowly but surely start coming around. And they were like, dude, are we gonna do this? You know? And I was like, Well, let's let's talk about it in the Q1 call. Now we're coming back to the Q1 calls. Let's let's put it in the Q1 call. Let's let people tell their opinion about it. Yes or no. Is this better product? Whatever. Da, 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 da. And we knew going into that, that we were pretty much going to do it anyways. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it, cause it wasn't a vote and I, and I made sure to tell people it's not a vote. We just want to know cause we knew people were going to misunderstand it. That's the thing is like every conversation we had, we were working out how to talk about it. Right. Because you have language, you have seated, non-seated, you know, top 32 locked in, uh, qualifying has gone, you know, you yeah, have it's all a new this vocabulary, totally new vocabulary. But once we started to figure out how to talk about it, 
then people started coming around. They're like, oh, hold on a second. Then they realized all the things that you and I talked about at the beginning, the in between the round stuff, the predictable, knowable bracket at the end of each round, looking at who you're going to battle going into the subsequent round, how that's going to play a role in tire consumption, saving, like all these things. It's like, oh, okay, this feels like a no brainer. Right. And so, you know, that's basically how it all kind of came about. And I, I'd be honest, like if this works out well and it's the most awesome thing, I cannot take any credit for this. All of this credit, 100% of this credit goes to Kevin um, and the people that pushed us to go in that direction. And if it goes horribly, then it is my fault because I decided to do it. So, you know, that's how I have to look at these kind of things. Um, this is not anything that I can take credit for if it is a home run. But, you know, if, if it ends up sucking, it's ultimately my fault. Look, I want to know right in the comments right now, if you're coming to one of the events, if you are, drop a comment and uh, let me know if you use the promo code FD podcast to check out, save you a couple of dollars. Oh no, drive the comments up. You guys don't comment enough. I don't know if you knew this, but I'm in there all the time. And if I start seeing all these, that's, uh, that's only good for me. It makes the FD, you know, the higher ups, the, the, the grand poobahs happy. When you use FD podcast at checkout, they're a little happy. I mean, you know, they're not, they're not making as much money, but they're fine with it because they know you guys actually listen and you, and you, and you do the things that I ask you to do. So if you buy a ticket, take a couple seconds, FD podcast at checkout, save a couple bucks. And, uh, yeah, at the end of the year, they go, Hey, you sold the ticket. So see you guys out there. Yeah. It's, I mean, as a leader, that's, I mean, that's the, way you have to let it roll right like you know give give kudos to the team that developed it and then take the backlash for having the final stamp of approval right um i don't know i i i'm excited for it the more i think about it the more excited i get about it so now that i'm able to like discuss it openly <laughs> is gonna be so much better i've had a couple of conversations with people in the industry about it and, and the feedback's been good um uh, i'm super excited to like get this out uh, and just like air it. So that way I can start answering DMS a little bit easier and, and have these open conversations with people and, and just understand what their thoughts are. Cause there's definitely parts of this that we still haven't explored from the marketing side, the logistics side. Um, the only, honestly, the only real complaint that I've heard that I don't, I, I know we've discussed ways to get around it is some of the airtime for the top drivers, that mm -hmm. because they're not in yeah. qualifying and they're not going to be part of that, basically that day, they are going to be losing airtime and we are going to be giving more airtime to drivers that are um, in the in the, the seating brackets. So yeah. that is that is the one complaint that I heard that I was like, oh, that is tough. And that's a legitimate complaint. That's yeah. why we're going to film practice. Sick. Yeah. So I think, you know, <laughs> what what I wanted to do with that is. Um, and I need, and I'm still kind of ironing this out because I want that thing. And you and I will talk about this offline about how, how do we, how do we structure that? Because obviously now right. you've got a different role over the event weekend, um, consistently as opposed to like randomly, right. Last year, um, yeah. is, you know, is it an hour leading in and is it a talk over broadcast? Is it a welcome out? Hey, here's what's going on. All right. Watch practice. Do what all the hardcore guys like, turn up the gnat sound, let those guys rip. And, you know, then we capture the stories of practice. I think one of the things that maybe fans don't necessarily appreciate because they don't know the back end is what, 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 it, what ends up happening when we do a broadcast is we have somebody that's working in the background. It's taking every one of those qualifying uh, runs and they're clipping it and then they're putting it into a folder and then they're sending it out to the teams and then the teams can use that for social media or whatever. We share the rights with them. Um, and so what a Frederick Osbo gets, um, in a qualifying session or one of the top guys that barely, that almost never goes into that second run is they get that one run in their folder. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much the airtime that they get and the number one qualifier. You know, sometimes we'll get a, an interview maybe, um, if, uh, if that carries over from one year to the next, but basically you get that one run. I mean, I'm very confident that we can get five of those in the can for those guys that will probably perform equal or better to than a qualifying run. Um, and then they're still going. And then look, the reality is Oswald is not always going to be in that top 24, right? Yeah. So they're going to have to do that a couple times, um, probably maybe, maybe once or twice, depending on how things play out relative to historics. 
But I think we could, I think we can give equal value to the guys that are going to be missing that one qualifying run by filming some level of practice and then giving them access to those runs. Jeff Jones sent them something really interesting. And I have a lot of respect for Jeff. I think, you know, he's, he's an event person now too. And <laughs> I kind of get the sense that he's like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? What, this is crazy what you guys do. Um, you know, he was like on one, of, I think on the call, one of the calls, he said, you know, the, the fact that the top guys get to battle so much all the way down from start to finish is obviously because they've got good programs and they've competed well and they deserve to do that. And if I get knocked down the top 32, I only get the top 32. But I would like to have as many battles as they have on any given weekend. And if you're somebody that's like Jeff Jones and you are outside the top 24, just say for an example, now that's been given to you. So mm. now what, the, what he can share in common with Frederick Osbo is if he gets it knocked out in the top 32, he can have the same number of battles as Frederick Osbo who wins the event. Now, what happens if Jeff Jones runs the gauntlet and he's just like goes ape shit and just plows through in the top 16, right. wins in the top 32, wins in the top 16, wins in the grade eight and he gets a final four. How badass of a story is that? Right. Like that's, you know, that's, that's such an incredible story. Like we look at like a Nick Novak and Irwin Dell and how epic that whole run was. Imagine if, cause Nick would have been, if I remember correctly, Nick would have been in their bottom seated. Imagine if he ran through the seed, then came in and did the exact same thing again. Like, is that not more epic than qualifying first and winning the event that you won, you know, three, four more battles first and then came in and did the same thing again? Like, uh, it's it, it's just one it, of the it will. It, it's more stories. It's just one of the, the things plot. that comes about because of this change. Right. And right. and, you know. There's always going to be a, oh crap, this is what happened to me at this particular round. But that happens now too, right? Or it happens, yeah. it happens in the past. But now you've got this, you've opened this door to this really amazing, like really cool story arc that could potentially happen for somebody that all they need to do is make it through a few battles in that seating bracket and let's see how far they go in the top 32. I mean, that's an, from an airtime, from a value perspective, and also just the general story arc of that person's weekend could be amazing. Yeah. And the upside, you know, something I get about this show a lot is, is people commenting like, oh, I never knew anything about this driver. I didn't even really know anything about them. I'm happy that I was introduced. We're going to have that happen more often because yeah. there are drivers that are that are unknowns that are going to come up through. Right. Like, you know, if you don't watch Prospect, you may not know who Rudy Hansen is. You yeah. may not know with like how crazy that human being is and right. you, you know you're gonna see it now so um i see so yeah, i definitely want to get back to the qualifying thing there are so many changes uh i don't know if we're going to get to all of them i i think i might even have some of the judging stuff with uh with one of the judges a bit later on um but there are definitely a few that i want to talk about um protests going away mm -hmm. that that is something that is i is very divisive. I feel like internally, yeah. Uh, you know, because realistically, there, you know, the, people want to have that ability to do it. Uh, I think yeah. from the fans' perspective, it's kind of split from from discussions yeah. with people on it. Mm -hmm. um, where where did all that come from? What are your thoughts on it? Because from the production side, protests yeah. are a nightmare. Because mm -hmm. you like how many we've had what two situations where we go into the top 16, we have to go, actually, we have to have a battle again because of this situation, whether, you know, whether it's justified or not. Oh, I mean, yeah. the worst is when you're at the end of the grade eight or the final four and you get a protest that comes in because you can't move forward. So you right. get a you get a St. Louis example last year where we literally burned 35 minutes of legitimate airtime because we were broadcasting on on Mav TV. I mean, I had a very serious television executive tell me that no serious sport has a situation where you're doing nothing for 35 minutes waiting for a judge to make a call. The reason right. why Major League Baseball and NFL have put so many constraints on the replay protests or whatever they're called in, in their particular thing is because it needs to be made in a relatively short period of time. It just, it, there's not a model like that in, in drifting to be able to to do that because it's not just about looking at the replay. It's not like the guy can raise his hand and be like, you know, here's my flag or whatever. The guy's got to write up the protest. He's got to take it over there. He's got to make sure that it's validated. 
the guy, then the driver steward has to look at it. If it's validated, then we have to bring it into the show. And then we say, then we have to tell that driver, go change your tires, go back, get back around. We're going to rerun the run again. By the time it's all said and done, you at minimum, you're talking 10, 15, 20 minutes if you're lucky. Now, if that happens in the top 16 or the top 32, it's not that big of a deal because you can move forward with the rest of the bracket and deal with right. it in the background. But when you're in the main show, when you're in the peak moment, you know, when you're trying to promote a sport to a mainstream audience and you got and you have a variable baked into your system that says maybe we could have 40 minutes of downtime, it's unacceptable. It's just not going to work long term if you want to grow the sport. But why did we have protests in the first place? What's the historical precedent for that? It's all pre-broadcast stuff. It's all yeah. pre-broadcast stuff where it didn't matter, where we could you know, go back and look at something ad nauseum before we were doing anything live at all. That dates back to like the very first rule books that we've ever had. So that that needs to be updated. There's not a technological fix to that that makes it make sense. And I think here's the other part of this that I think is really important. Every protest that has been validated that I was able to find in the past four or five years, for the most part, has been about whether or not something was an incomplete or not, right? So right. now what happens if you say incompletes are kind of not really there anymore? It's the most extreme things are incompletes. The spinning out, the you know driving straight for two seconds. We've taken incompletes as kind of this um, you know category of well, was it three tires off or four tires off? You know, was it straightening or not straightening? Did he you know opposite drift? Whatever. Da 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 da. And what is drifting? What is what drifting? Is, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, I threw my hands yeah. up after that. I was like, you know what? We're done with all this shit. Like we're we gotta we gotta get it so that the judges can just. Judge, judge and do their thing and not have them either be pigeonholed into an incomplete or have an out as an incomplete. And so, you know, the idea there is just is just to say that if incompletes have become so strict now, like they're the things that nobody in in, in theory that nobody disagrees with. Like I'm pretty sure you agree that if you spin out, that's we should call that an incomplete. Pretty sure right. if you crash into a wall and stop stop drifting, that should be an incomplete everything else we can judge, right? For the most part, we can basically judge it. Now, if you have that, it almost makes protests irrelevant because now it's just a judge's job to do their job. The only one that I can think of that went through and was caught was Matt Kaufman, man, five, six years ago where somebody jumped the light and it wasn't caught. That's it. Mm. It's yeah, the only one I can with, think of. You went back before my, before, before my review, but yeah. I think <laughs> <laughs> it's up here. I mean, I wasn't even it just, just, you know, trying to go back to the database in my brain. That's the only one I can think of, but yeah, I agree. The rest of it was that, um, I mean, there was some, a little bit back and forth with Dylan Hughes in St. Louis with the rumble strip coming off the track and how that affected things. Mm -hmm. That was like a, a track issue that could have been dealt with the same way that like, you know, someone would argue with, uh, Orlando having a pothole or something. Yeah. So well, and there's the, always going to be fringe cases, right? What's the recourse though, right? Like what, what is it, if you're getting rid of a uh, protest, what is the thing that you have baked into the series that drivers can feel like that if there was an actual wrong that it could be rectified? And yeah. most people don't know about this, but we've always had an appeals based system in our rule book. And so now instead of protests and appeals, it's no protest, but appeals. And, you know, there's been at least two or three examples that I can remember, um, let's say within the past three years, where an appeal has been used effectively for a person to gain a position or gain points. One was uh, Erie Bond versus um, Odie Bakshi. He appealed the result there because of the uh, of a, you know, so-called B cell. And mm -hmm. we basically gave him, uh, we gave him the points for winning the battle, but we didn't take it away from Bond. So right. I see a lot of those scenarios being very similar in nature, where if we find something that if somebody puts a, an appeal in and it's pretty clear that there was a mistake made, whatever that case may be, we can just talk about it conceptually. And that person was about to go from 16 to eight, then we would award them the points for eight and call it a, call it a day. I think that's a fair middle ground 
to have a product that's much more clean and at the end of the day is going to be better for drivers because if drivers need to be a part of something that ultimately is sellable, marketable, and that people that spend money, i.e. sponsors and fans, want to be a part of. If you have an executive, if you have somebody from a big television company telling you that no serious sport burns 45 minutes, I mean, I was so embarrassed. Like I was like, yeah, this is crazy. Why are we doing this? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, finally I, I, you know, I got Kevin to come around to it and and he did, he did, you know, we had a lot of discussions about it, but it's like, we got to get rid of this. Well, I mean, even last year kind of being my first year just in the booth and experiencing it, like there were two separate protests that lasted over an hour where somebody, a spotter was actively trying to reconvince the judges of something for over an hour. Mm -hmm. And it's tough and it's a distraction and it's difficult and it adds stress to the room. And, you know, it's, it's more than that. And I do think that there's going to be occasions where, you know, that, that the other system needs to be put into place, but it's going to be an ultimate of like ends justifying the means. It'll mean the show can go a little bit quicker uh, and not even quicker, just more efficient. Right. And, you know, I, I speak for the fans and saying like, none of us want to watch the commercials over and over again. We just want to watch cars, you know, drive next to each other. So if we can cut down on needless dead time, then let's cut down on needless dead time. Yeah. I mean, the primary criticism that we get relative to other, um, you know, brands that are doing quick broadcasts that either don't have commercials or that do it in a different kind of way is like, you guys are too long. It takes too much time. Well, why does it take too much time? It's not because the drivers are horrible. It's not because the staff can't put people in a burnout box. It's it's because we have all these things built into it. We have yeah. these layers upon layers of replays in, in the old system. You know, the, the idea of what it should be is the run occurs, let's like say tandem, for example, the run occurs uh, or it ends the second run. There's a replay. You got the first replay on the first run. There's a, there's a second look with the drone and then you put your score in. That's mm-hmm. how it's supposed to go. It's not, you're not supposed to sit there and go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You need to have a rule book that guides you to be able to tell you how to make a decision. Yes, it might be hard, but there will be an answer, right? Um, That's one of the reasons behind like trying to clarify what should be a justifiable one more time as well is like, right. Let's not make it so like, um, you know, let's not make it so undefined like, oh, it's, it could be, I can't decide therefore one more time. Like that's not good. It shouldn't be a one more time for a shit run. I think it's right. is like to, to boil it down and be <laughs> succinct. Like that's it. Yeah. And nobody yeah. wants to see that. Nobody wants to see a one. Nobody wants to see a one more time because of a bad battle. Right. Yeah. And, and I think there's a, a very interesting line in, I believe the judging regulations, um, which is it is not enough to compare lead to lead and chase to chase to determine a winner. The judges also need to look at which driver did better overall in all aspects of judge criteria. That is such a, like that adds a lot of minutia into what is going on, but I do think we'll make for a better and more definitive decision because do you like, do you like that? You like that paragraph? I do. I do like that line okay. because like this, well, I wrote that we do. We, we very much fight over like, Oh, these, this small mistake here and that small mistake there. And we get away. F- the, the judges, I'm trying to like the best way to explain it. The fans judge with their hearts. Mm-hmm. They, they look at it. And, and one shot, they're like, I've made my call. Yeah. And, the, and if you put a hundred fans with a hundred buttons making that call, it would, they would all be in before the judges were done. And I think we've gotten so analytical because we've had to, because mm-hmm. drifting has gotten to a point where we, we have to be so succinct and, and so specific on these, on these, on this minutia that it became such a technical aspect, but having something that allows you to be like overall, they just did a better job might seem like a cop out, but it kind of goes back to what we know as quality drifting. Yeah. Right. We we've added so many layers into the judging criteria and so many specifics and so many of these little details about angle and initiation and where in tandem a car needs to be and how they should transition that we have forgotten the, the, the the feeling of that was a that was a crazy run and that line alone allows us to get back to that like Every, x factor was kind of like the precursor to it yeah i mean that's where i realized that i was out of touch with the fans um with the reaction to x factor because 
X factor, um, in my opinion, was addressing the thing that was missing, right? Okay. So like, think about in, in a traditional qualifying single round qualifying, you have to have, um, you have to have categories and a system that can account for anything that's possible to happen in qualifying. Right. Right. And obviously you have all the basics line angle, and then whatever you determine style to be. And X factor was this thing that came about because Brian Eggert and, um, and Lantane used to say all the time, like, there's something about the way this particular driver drives that I don't have something in my tool book to address from a points perspective. It's almost like I want to give them a bonus because they're doing so much more. And, and like, it's very clear what, what we're talking about there. You know, it's going to be when James Dean explodes out with the most insane smoky run, when Chelsea Denofa just absolutely murders it. When Odie does one of his crazy, you know, 99 point runs or whatever, like we've all seen it. There's, there is an X factor to mm -hmm. their driving. And so the intention of that I felt was right. I think we applied it horribly, right? The fact that, <laughs> pe that people were getting one and two points or zero points for X factor and nobody was ever getting above a five, I think was a total tragedy. It's a hundred percent my fault. I should have dictated from the beginning guys, this is how this X factor thing is supposed to work. But I didn't do that. And, you know, it backfired. But luckily, it that allowed us to get to where we are now. So I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, you, you tried to like all the best intentions, obviously, but you tried to add an emotional thing into an analytical decision. And it's very difficult. Like, is it how far on the edge of my sheet, my seat was I right? Like, like, you know, how I, I I'm trying to remember who said, I want to say it was Chris, was like, if I'm yelling, that should be all the X, X factor points. Mm -hmm. If I'm like, oh my God, that that should be every X factor point. And, and he's like, and then I just scale back from there. Yeah. And I'm I think like, that's, that's, wrong, that's wrong because that's not how we wrote it in the rule book. I mean, it, in the rule right. book, X factor was something that was measurable. It wasn't supposed to be, oh, I had a feeling, right? But I mm -hmm. think that's, I look, I don't want to prejudge the way that history with those guys took place and how they did it. I, the bottom line is we did it wrong and it, 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 it became a yeah. situation where, you know, fans could, that was a dig for us, you know, or to us from fans. And it's just because like, to your point, we got way too freaking technical, right? When it's supposed to be, <laughs> it's supposed to be more simple, right? You cannot be a like drifting genius to come to an FD event and understand what's going on. You need to be able to right. show up and be like, ah, okay, I got it. You know, like I kind of get what's going on. Like my parents, that, I always use them as a model. I'm like, do you Same. understand why that guy won? Okay, tell me why. Oh, okay, this and that, whatever this guy did, whatever. I'm like, okay, yeah, cool. All right, we're on the right track. If they give me some answer that's way out in left field, then I'm like, okay, we're failing, you know? I just tell people, I'm like, the car in front is trying to get to all the cones and white lines <laughs> while the car behind him is trying to get as close as he can without hitting them. And uh, they're like, yep. oh, okay. Yep. And maybe we've strayed away from that because we had to. We just, it got too good. And people understood the rules too well and drove to the rules too well. So instead of maybe simplifying the rules, we felt like we just had to add more to make it more specific and more detailed, more difficult. And, I think, it, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think it's that, but I also just think that it's in, it's part of the natural evolution of the sport because, um, you know, so much of drifting becomes unbelievably simple. If you don't have proximity, the, dri <laughs> the driver A versus driver B, the moment you get proximity is the proximity is the moment that, you, that you bring in things like contact and collisions and, you know, all that fun stuff. It adds a layer of, of technicality to it by nature. And so then you have to address it, right? You have to say, oh, should that guy have been able to make an adjustment or a correction for the other guy? Well, if you come from the Japanese purist side of things, they're going to say yes. If you come from the American side, they're going to say, no, that's bullshit. It, it, you, have a, you have a quarter second reaction time as, as, with the, as the best baseball player in the world. You want me to react faster than a quarter second when I'm a millimeter away from this guy? And he puts it and he lets off throttle or, or, you know, hits his brake. You don't know what you're right. talking about. So, you know, that's, that's where the rub comes in. Yeah. And it, it's tough too, because, 
you know, different series put proximity in different rankings to where FD does. I, I feel like we've maybe kind of gotten away from proximity as the main thing and, and gone more towards line. And line was the, the main precursor to what was a good tandem. It was a good follow. So it was more like line angle. You had to match their line. You had to match their angle. And then proximity was a bonus. Whereas proximity is the easiest thing for anybody to understand. Yeah. For anybody who doesn't watch drifting, it's very simple to understand that guy's close to that guy. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know, my two cents. That's why I'm here, though. It's a good It's a good <laughs> sense. I like it. It's more like a quarter. Yeah. I, hey, I mean, I'll, I'm just giving it away for free now, apparently. <laughs> um, cool. I, I, I think the other interesting thing to talk about and i'm trying desperately not to like toot my own horn here at all is like are you are you cool and ready to step out of the booth this year like are you still going to be like hanging out in the corner like how's this gonna work oh hell yeah <laughs> I, i've been ready to hang them up you know um <laughs> I, I i you know i had a really great experience doing that um i didn't ever want to do any of that stuff all both the television show that i did in the early days and all the live commentary stuff was purely by necessity, not because I wanted to or be in front of the camera or anything like that. I don't want to be known. You know, if I could do this and be completely faceless, I would. Um, that's my preference. It's why I don't really post on social media. I'm not very active in that space. You know, I I, I have this. Ryan Lantain gave me this book. It's called So You've Been Publicly Shamed. And it was the first <laughs> it, it was the first time that him and I separately got publicly shamed. And I just kind of realized like, ah, it's not for me. You know, I'll, mm. I'll respond to comments. I'll talk to people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not going to put my life out on social media. So, you know, in that same kind of sense, I don't, I'm not really trying to be like a drift celebrity or anything like that. Uh, I like that I could help perform a service. I'm free, obviously, when I, when I do announcing and stuff like that. Um, but I, I have, I have other things that I need to do and it's just hard to, balance all that and you, and you see that right like you're in there you kind of yeah. see what i'm up to getting pulled in different directions sometimes it's 10 different directions sometimes it's three it just depends on on the situation and i just feel like i've had my time and you know i'm sick of sitting jared next, next to jared anyway so <laughs> it's your burden it's your burden now no nah, no nah, it's not a it's definitely not a burden i mean when when the announcement went out, there was obviously some comparisons to that. And and I said to everybody, I'm like, listen, Jared's been doing this for 20 years. Like, I have nothing but the utmost respect for the guy because that's the person I'm that's the guy I'm gonna learn from. That's the guy I'm gonna sit next to. You know, a good example of this that <clears throat> almost nobody would know is um during the James Dean situation when he hit Nerwindale, I I thought the right thing to do is like continue to like talk about the situation. And Jared, like like kind of like grabbed me to shush me. I remember that. And I yeah, kind of like looked at him like, what? And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? And he like, you know, covers his mic like he does and mutes himself. And he's like, just let the situation breathe for a second. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, just let everybody grasp what's just happened. We don't need to say anything. We're not going to make anything better or worse. Just let it breathe. And then we'll come back in. And I was like, okay. And I, just, I, cause I didn't know. And, and hundred percent, he was right in that situation. Like that was the right thing to do. This was, you know, cause at that time we didn't know how James was. We didn't know what the situation was like. We were all kind of scared cause it was crazy. Yeah. And that's how we left it. So yeah, for me, like I just, I have so much to learn. Like it's so much to learn from him about the, the etiquette and, and how to do all this. And, you know, I, I know I'll bring a different piece than what he does. That's, that's why I tell everybody, I'm like, let me be nerdy. Let him be excited. And yeah. I think you, I think you guys I will be do. fine. I mean, obviously everybody, you know, respects you. Um, it's not, it's not, uh, easy to be in that chair. Uh, you know, part of it is, uh, trying, I always had the, 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 you know, the very tough job of remaining politically neutral. Um, mm. you know, when I, when I first was talking about leaving, I had mentioned it in our, uh, in our driver summit and JTP came up to me afterwards. He's like, you can't, he's like, there's no freaking way you can do that because we were talking about bringing in judges to do, um, the commentary because the reason why we were thinking about doing that is because so many fans had contacted us about getting more explanations from the judges and having, you know, somebody like Lantain who, who can explain things and talk about, you know, what's going on, be there in real time to talk about it. So this was, this was, dictated by fans. It was pushed on us by fans. But what we quick, quickly realized is that 
sometimes what they want isn't the thing that they need. Um, mm. And so when I was doing it, you know, I always had to be very cautious about, you know, trying to make sure that I'm not talking bad about somebody's run, but I'm trying to emphasize what somebody's doing well, as opposed to what somebody's doing poorly in a tandem, in a tandem battle. Um, and, and making sure that, you know, I'm, it doesn't come off or doesn't seem like I'm ceding territory to one driver over the other for some particular right. reason, because if you know who I am, you know, that, you know, obviously people are going to say, oh, well, Ryan's talking good about so-and-so that must mean that they're going to win this event or whatever. And that obviously we all know that that's not true, but I always, always had to play it safe. Whereas Jared, Jared, um, you know, oftentimes, you know, we'll get in trouble for not necessarily playing it as safe as myself, but I had to do that because there was this, just a stricter scrutiny on what I might say about a particular driver. So I really try to focus my craft on the things that were not going to be disputable. They weren't going to be questionable. If it was, I would say, you know, I think the judges could be thinking this, but on the other hand, perhaps this and this and this and this, okay, now both parties, mm. both sides, you know, have gotten their thing. And I feel like I got pretty decent at that um, and found my voice, but it's way too much fucking work. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, to that point, something I, I tell my staff all the time is when speaking in absolutes, be absolutely sure. Because mm -hmm. like the moment you say something definitive, you need to be definitive in, in that answer because it's going to stick. Yeah. So I know, I know what you're saying that like, it's, it's tough. Um, yeah, I don't know. I know I've got a, a big chore and a lot of a lot of learning to do ahead of me, but um, I'm stoked and and I really appreciate you presenting the offer and um, yeah, for all the fans, like the feedback was crazy. That's why I like asked you. I'm like, can you just tell me before the announcement? Because like, I honestly I wanted to spend the afternoon like reading comments, responding to comments, like in a weird way too, like looking for criticism to be like, okay, here's things I need to improve on because that's that's what I do at this show. I'll read the comments where people are like, oh, you do this thing or you don't do that. Or I wish you did that. And I'm like, okay, let me see if I can improve for the next one. Cause that's the only way I'm going to get better at it. But uh, yeah, the feedback was, was pretty phenomenal. So I'm shocked and awed and honored by the whole situation. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually really glad to hear you say that because I, I think it is the height of ignorance to um, not listen to your interlocutors or your peers if they give you a valid criticism about right, what you valid. do, you know, obviously there's a lot of bullshit criticisms that don't make any sense. And you can, you already know that, or they're a troll, for example. Um, that's totally fine. You know, there's those people like there, but I've learned so much from the fan base. And then I always like to say like being in a driver's meeting is, is like being in a room where you're never going to be the smartest person. And you never want to be the smartest person in the room because if you are, you're in the wrong room. And that's how it is being in those, in those driver's meetings or in those quarterly calls is there's always going to be a handful of people that you're going to be able to learn something from, whether it's just experience or perspective or a better analysis of the situation. Um, and the reason why you want that is so ab abundantly clear. It's because you, it's going to make you better. You know, it's mm -hmm. going to make you be more thoughtful, more caring, more understanding. You're going to be able to see that person over and be like, oh, that person over there, driver, staff, uh, you know, a fan that you've run into multiple times, he has this quirk. And I know that I'm going to tailor, you know, my interactions with him to take that into account so that him and I can get a better result out of our relationship or him or her and I can get a better result out of our relationship. It doesn't mean that you lose yourself, that you lose your soul. You're like, this is, you know, I have my ideology and this is it. I'm never going to change or whatever. No, it's, it's that when you interact with people at a certain level, you know, you want to be able to try to get the most out of that relationship as you can. And that means accepting criticisms on board and really thinking about what people have to say about what you might not be doing right. That's why I don't care. It doesn't hurt me to say, oh, we fucked this up or we didn't do a good job here or this was a mistake or whatever the case may be. Because if all, if all I did was, you know, hide from that or shy away from it, even though I know in my head, oh, we got that wrong. That's not yeah. how you want to do it. You just want to say, look, we got that wrong. We're going to fix this. We're going to go in the right direction. It's very anti-politics, right? Like there will always be, they'll always figure out a way to work around like, 
they did something wrong and make it sound like the coolest thing in the world, just accept it. Right. And then move forward and get better. Yeah. It's, I, someone told me very recently that the, the criticisms that hurt the most are the ones, you know, are true. Um, but it also, it's like, yeah, you should, if you feel that like you should correct it or like, look at why that's coming through and, and make a decision to either accept that criticism and not change or accept that criticism and change. Cause you can ignore the criticism all you want, but it's not going to, you know, if, if you truly feel it, then it, it's probably something you need to, to look into. That's, that's at least how I look at it. Cause I, I know what I, you mean. I, yeah. I know what yeah, you mean. I've seen tons of stuff where I'm like, yeah, that doesn't do anything to me because I know it's just, you know, it's just bullshit. And then everyone, you know, somebody, somebody was uh, talking about just me agreeing when somebody else is talking. And it was just like, just, Hey, can you cut that out? It's distracting. I want to hear what they have to say. I don't want to hear you go. Mm-hmm. So I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> it's such a small thing. I don't need to do that. So I just yeah. cut it out. And then I noticed, okay, it does sound better. Yeah, uh, there was like a couple of words that people brought up, like, "Oh, you say this." I say "interesting" way too often. I'm like, "Okay, hit, I'm going to hit the thesaurus and find another word and mm-hmm. and rotate words." Like, I, don't know, I just, I don't, I don't like the status quo. I don't like things static. I don't. I always want some sort of progression. So, for me, you know, as I've said to in podcast past, like if you have a critique that's warranted and well put together, I'll listen. But yeah. The moment you just get a tacky, I'm like, yeah, yeah, your, your point is no longer valid. Yeah. And it's hard yeah. to weed through those sometimes because they, they, they're the yeah. ones that tend to come to the surface faster, but you know, yeah. the, the ones that are valuable, you, you know, it, you know, and the, vo- the vocal minority is, is always tough to, to cut through. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I mean, I, you know, I've made, you know, part of my career, especially in the internet era, I I intentionally reached out to fans. I mean, just the other day, just the other day. Okay, so this is great. Um, uh, somebody, Jeff Jones is on the podcast, right? And yeah. somebody, somebody like made a comment about Jeff or something, you know, talking shit about Jeff or something about what, the way that he was running Hot Pit or something like that. And, um, you know, Jeff Jones is a badass dude. I mean, people don't understand that this is a guy one of the OGs that was running at the time pro two and pro at the same time was pro two champion. So suck it. I mean, mm. this guy, this guy <laughs> is like the epitome of, of a hard worker. Now, a he de- now he decides to run his own series and, and run a, a pro program at the same time. And a person over here wants to criticize him because he's, he is doing X, Y, and Z thing, uh, you know, at, at hot pit. Who the fuck are you to tell Jeff Jones what to do? <laughs> right. Jeff, Jeff Jones is the in the position that he's in. You are not in that position. When you are in that position, then you can criticize Jeff Jones. Until then, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's true. It's tough, and uh, you know, on top of that, he's also running a successful business, and you know, has a, a family. Like it's. It's just, yeah, it's so frustrating when you see things like that. I, I, I I don't, I don't always agree with the idea of like, everyone has a right to their own opinion. I I prefer they have the right to their own informed opinion opinion. Mm -hmm. And like that, that's what has always stuck with me. Everyone's going to have an opinion, but you can tell when somebody's done some sort of research and some sort of, you know, thought process behind that opinion. And that's, that I will always respect more than someone who just blurts out the first thing that comes to mind. And there are, there that's are coming two, from somebody who yeah blurts the first thing that comes to their mind all the time. There are, <laughs> but, there are two sides or multiple sides to an issue, each of which have a sophisticated reasoning process. And right. you, both of them could go back and forth and talk about the merits of each thing. Um, and then there's the very surface level. I just got to the party and I just threw a bomb into the party by reading one little post or I read an article about something and now I'm an expert in suspension, right? And so (laughs) everybody else is 75 steps ahead in the whole thing, having a really nice dialogue going back and forth. They do disagree fundamentally, but they're both making their case. And you just come in from the outside, streaking naked, running in, throwing this very ill-informed opinion in into the party and messing up the whole thing for everybody. And then you know, a nice person, maybe like me might stop and say, Hey, you know what? You kind of made a mistake there. 
here's what's going on. These guys are actually experts in this area and we can we can help you get in that direction. But this opinion that you have is not well informed, right? And, mm-hmm. and it's very easy to understand that. So, you know, just be a little bit humble and understand like, look, not everybody can be an expert in everything. I'm a moron in some things. I don't know a lot. I, I know enough to know that I don't know a lot about a lot of things. Right. And so I'm going to be very cautious about the things that I say with confidence above and beyond where it is, you know, and, and that in our world in today, we don't have a lot of that um, <laughs> because the world is very sophisticated and hard and very difficult to understand. And everything is ideology. So, you know, it just makes it very hard to get along. So when you find like-minded people that will both uh, get to the, get to the root of an issue and both take the time to be able to understand it, even though they disagree, it actually is kind of cool. It's it's interesting to hear you like run through your conflict resolution. Um, just just I mean I've seen it in person. I've I've seen it online. I've, I, you know, um, somebody brought up to me recently like what was the tower like in St. Louis when the rainstorm came in? Uh, I was I, and I just kind of brought it up. I said it, it was a it was it was the day that I understood why Ryan Sage was the leader, uh, and I, I think that's how I broke it down because. It was a crazy situation. It was super chaotic. And this is when the storm came in during prospect and we were trying to decide what to do. And what oh, was interesting last is to, year, last year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And watching you go, okay, I have all of these people in this room. I have the discord blowing up with prospect drivers. I have staff to deal with. I have, you know, uh, different union groups to deal with, with like tracking things and, and ambulances and all this stuff. And just like watching you break it down into bite-sized pieces and literally going to everybody in the room, including me, which I, I, which I thought was shocking. And you're like, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? And then like, okay. And you kind of sat there and did one of these. And then you're like, 15 minutes, I'm going to ask everybody again what we should do. <laughs> and we're like, what? And you're like, yeah, in 15 minutes, I'm going to ask you all what we should do. And then, and that's literally what happened. We just kind of sat the rain delay. And then you're like, okay, here's the next set of information. This is what we're going to go through. And it was just really interesting to watch somebody triage a situation like that because the easy thing from the outside is, oh, just postpone it to the next day. Mm-hmm. But what most people don't realize is like, while you were thinking that and probably wanted to do that, you were also calling and contacting people and going like, okay, do we have staff for tomorrow? Do we have an ambulance for tomorrow? Do we have a tow truck for tomorrow? What's going to happen with this? How many hours is everybody going to be working? Can we get catering that quick? Like you're... but. You were going through that, but instead of you dealing with all those, you just called everybody in those departments and said, you have 15 minutes, see where you can get in 15 minutes to solve this issue and mm-hmm. just went through. And it was just, it was, it was very fascinating to watch because it was the first time I watched you truly as a leader because mm. every other time you just kind of been this dude that hangs out and, and sends me weird texts and emails on the odd occasion. <laughs> but it was the first time I saw you actually as like a boss and I was like, oh shit, this is why you are where you are is because of this ability to stay calm, utilize your personnel correctly, and then make the correct decision with the information given it on hand. Yeah. Most of the events is just following a, you know, um, a structure that's been set in place months prior, right? You, you get yeah. there and you just kind of move forward with it and everybody has a role and you're just checking the boxes that you go along. But as soon as you get a variable that comes in, uh, then it's something you have to deal with. I mean, it, you know, in drifting, especially in competition, there's always going to be variables. There's always going to be discussions. There's always going to be people that want to you know, talk about X, Y, and Z. When you get in the situation like we got in St. Louis, you're, what, what's going on there is literally the decision between being able to pay somebody's salary or not, right? Like mm. that decision what ended up being like a $65,000 decision like that. <laughs> and, and, you know, having to explain that you know, to a a CFO or something and then say, well, what were the alternative options? Right. And, you know, if I don't have the right one, you know, I'm going to be taking it on the head or something along those lines. So, but look, at the end of the day, um, there was no real option other to do what we were to do, what we, what we did. Um, if, if we kept going, uh, we would have, caused so many problems uh, that had other downstream effects that the right thing to do was to basically tie off the nub and take the hit on the head, pay the overtime, get everybody to come back, 
go through the departmental checks. Is there anything glaring that we're missing? Okay, boom, let's go. I, I mean, I wish I could have made that decision faster, but there was a, there's a, a look, I mean, the irony of that is it started getting dry after we made that decision, but right. there was there ultimately there was flooding and it wouldn't, it didn't subside for hours. So it didn't really matter anyways. And, you know, it's one of those kind of things when we go back to that venue, it'll be like the, the second and third and fourth and fifth time of rechecking. Will these drains drain in this situation, you know, this time? And, you know, it's not the venue's right. fault that that took place. It's just the fact that it was like a 25 year storm. <laughs> yeah. Which seems to happen every couple of years there in St. Louis. That, I mean, Orlando gets like kind of the, the, the shit end of the stick in a lot of cases, but man, St. Louis has not made it easy to like it. <laughs> I know. I That's know. it. Like, I, and I like St. Louis. I love the people. The venue's super cool. It's like, it's such a, a prestigious place to be. But man, 110 degrees, 90% humidity, insane storms, you know, tents everywhere. It's uh, definitely makes it a little bit trying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you know, there was a, a couple of years or two where we were really like cranking there for from a weather perspective where, you know, I think what that kind of became is kind of like a Vegas alternative, no, knowing that we would go mm -hmm. till 1231, 130. And, and, and backload everything into the day where, you know, people could come later in the day, they could sleep in, um, not have to worry about the heat as much. And so once you avoid that, it's great. But then all of a sudden, then it's the rain, right? So, mm. you know, that's the crazy thing. I have friends that, um, that work at, um, Nitro Cross and, oh man, they had such a tough time with weather this year. Like they went up to Canada, you know, for their snow race and there was no snow, they were out at, uh, you know, at Glen Helen and there was 75 mile per hour winds and wind holds and all this kind of stuff. And it's just like outdoor events. That's how it goes. I mean, I, oh man, I would love to be, you know, Madison Square Garden inside of a baseball stadium with roof and all that kind of stuff. Everything predictable, top to finish, but it's just not ace. Yeah. Oh, come on. Other places do it. Why can't we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe one, uh, right? <clears throat> I, I, I will still maintain the price to rent a stadium in Poland is very different than it is in America. I'm just, yeah. just going to put that out there. <laughs> I'm yeah. sure. Two very different price points. <laughs> uh, well, as much as I know you and I kind of discussed a, a, a list of things to go through, we're already at two hours and I do want to, I kind of want to get this bracket done. I'm not going to lie. Okay. So I'd love to continue to hang out. Uh, I maybe we'll, maybe we'll do a mid season recap. I'll keep this list ready to go. Sure. Um, but I, I'm, I'm glad we spent the time that we spent running through what this new system is, um, because the, the number of questions that I received and I'm sure you've received and, you know, we're still going to receive is, is crazy. And I do think it's the best way to move forward. And I'm, I'm just absolutely pumped to see what happens. Me too. But if I so. if I disappear from the, from the, the world after round one, you'll know why. <laughs> Great, good to know. Who's your successor? How's that work? Like, I just is Kevin next up? Like, I don't know how this how this operates. Oh man, I'll, I'll tell you a story after you know, maybe off air or whatever about something in regards to that that I had to do recently. Um, oh man, you know, it's a it, it, it's a <laughs> it's approaching. You know, it's approaching. Like, I I definitely have been rejuvenated um, in this position, like doing it alone. But like, you know when was the last time you spent 20 years at any given job? You know, um, dude, I can barely make it like three or four. So, <laughs> and even if, even if you're in the same industry, I mean, the great thing about this job for me personally is the fact that it, it isn't one thing. It's not like, mm -hmm. you know, a CEO or a marketing executive or working on operations or doing live stream or television production or doing design or whatever. It's all those things at various times. Plus like what, what the vision is. Um, that's why it's easier or it's, it's not as easy to get bored. It's very easy to get stressed out and to want to just be like, fuck this. I'm out. You know, I've had enough of this shit, you know, move me yeah. on into somewhere else. But ultimately what ends up happening, I have a conversation with a driver or two. We have a really amazing event. I start getting that feeling again, like I am right now, where all of a sudden, like everybody's starting to talk about what's going on. People are getting hyped up. The non trolls, uh, the people that love the sport, are getting super amped. I'm getting hit up by all the super fans. I'm having conversations with the super fans. I just had a I just had a conversation with the super fan the other day. Asked me if I could show them our deck, 
So I'm like, all right, here's my Calendly. Make, make an appointment with me or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I did the deck. I did the deck for her. And, um, you know, it was fun. I like doing stuff like that. So that's why I have my my public information out to the fans. But um, yeah, then I'm like, OK, this is why I do that. This is why I do it. Right. I, I love that part of it. Yeah, I mean, I, you and I can swap super fan stories. I'm I'm just learning of the super fans now, which I love all you guys. You're great. If I don't get back to you right away, it's because you've sent me eight messages and I can't get to all of them at once. So, <laughs> all right. So, how do you want to do this? Do you want Do you want to? Okay. So, okay. Let's explain. Let's explain what we're going to do. All right. So let's go back for way. people that you know are looking at the chapters or whatever. If we do, if we're doing chapters, what we're going to do? So we're using Pro as the model here. This is my bingo. Uh, cage or whatever <laughs> I bought for this. But what we're going to do is we're basically going to pull the number two through seven to do the sorting. So go back in the podcast and watch in it. And Jacob and I will kind of explain, or we did explain how that's all going to work because I don't want to pretend like I'm pulling a random number out of my pocket or put it in a, in a hat. I decided the best way to do it is to actually do it random in front of the fans. And I have this, uh, this bingo, what is this? What is this called? I, I don't know. It's like, it's for like lottery balls, bingo balls. Yeah. Okay. So I, I just want to make sure everybody's real clear. So nobody knows there's no BS going on here. Watch. I lose one of the balls. Can you see that number right there? The, like, uh, I don't know if it's going to focus on it. Okay. Well, anyways, these are, this is numbers two through seven. I kind of want you right. to, I kind of want you to be able to see it. So what about from there? I think so. We're going to have to do some work in post. All right. <laughs> that doesn't make that sound any better. <laughs> All right. So there's two, right? Okay. There's two. There's three, right? Okay, good. Man, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> there's four. <laughs> I haven't got a new camera for this anyways. Okay. There's five. We got number five here. Okay. All right. Here's number six with the line underneath it. Boom. Yep. And here's number seven. So for pro, it's going to be two through seven. Let's see if I can get a better shot of that. It's kind of hard to see with that small screen, but so two through seven. So Jacob, what we're going to do here is we're going to put it in our little machine. It's so crazy. Man. Just what the <laughs> fuck am I doing? I don't know. I love it though. All right. And the first ball that comes out is going to be our number, right? And so that basically it has a little, it has these little pickup points. And it, when I roll it through, it'll eventually pick one up and then it'll grab it and it'll pull it out. All right. So you ready? Here we go. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit, boy. It's number four. All right. I'm going to pull up the bracket. So this is it. So let me see, let me your, see, let me see. This is Ooh. your seating bracket. Oh man. <laughs> oh. So this is this is yeah, for anybody listening, go check it out. Make sure to jump over to YouTube. But if you're watching, um, this is officially wow. your seating bracket for Long Beach. Number four. Okay. So Xiao Berion versus Jeff Jones. That'll be I mean, all of these are solid. Brad Dan versus Derek Madison. Okay. So rookie Welcome versus to the show, comeback. Derek. And Dan, Kamo welcome back. And Rudy Hansen. Solid. <laughs> Andy Haitley, Hiro Mignola. That's going to be, that's wild. That's, yeah, super fast car versus somebody who's just about to understand what American drifting is like. Ryan Literal, Diego Higa. That's going to be another good battle. Uh, Shanahan and Dimitri Brudsky. So, yeah, Driftmasters champion versus three time <laughs> prospect champion. Uh, Mike Power versus Adam LZ. I like that. I actually really like that one. And then Ben Hobson and Federico Sharifo. So, wow. Doesn't it, I mean, it feels, it doesn't feel wrong, right? It feels like these no. are matched. I mean, obviously there's a difference between um, with Connor because, you know, he's an unranked driver. Dimitri is an unranked driver, right. uh, you know, coming into the championship. But the guys that have been around, it, it this feels like it's an organic result of something, right? And so, and that's just because of where they finished in those in the results previously. And then we'll have this same kind of logical structure, but it'll be based off of the event results. Wow. Yeah, I'm like running through different battles and like what could come, and then what what could like 
this is this is the cool part and this is the part that I, I want everyone to be excited about is like this this is it this is what you're going to see first set of battles in long beach this is you know the the california pinball machine ready to go we got a bunch of rookies we got a bunch of people coming in and coming back like this is wild yeah now i gotta think about how to my biggest struggle with this whole thing is about education right you know right. about how to talk about this not everybody is following our feed every single day not everybody is a hardcore fan not everybody is following the nuance is, you know, we've made a couple videos, obviously we're doing the podcast, you know, we'll put out as much information as we can, uh, how to talk about this and educate people on what's going on, whether or not they're super fans of it or kind of like whatever. Um, I think that's the thing that I, is going to be the most challenging leading up to uh, the first event is you want to try to get as many people, you know, up to speed on at least why this has happened yeah. and then how it has happened with this draw. Which you now just did, Jacob. Ah, I'm so excited. <laughs> I get to like think about this for the next several weeks, almost well, month. Yeah, I got a month to stare at this. I honestly, I mean, how to convey it? I mean, we got to try and whittle this down to 60 seconds. That's it. I mean, even 30 if we could do it. Um, just open it with like qualifying's dead. Everything you thought you knew about qualifying is gone. This is what it's going to be now. I'll send you a video of something that I shot with Tio, which is basically kind of like trying to simplify it. You know, what, um, I have a problem getting too detail oriented into things because I want a full explanation of it. And sometimes yeah. I just have to remember to be like, hey, keep it simple. If people have questions about something, then you can come back to the nuance. Um, I think that it's a good point you just made there is like trying to always have that front and center in explanation. Yeah. I, it's it's not easy trying to convey something this complex and get a a group of people to rethink what they know about a sport they love, right? And because it's not it's not a double elimination, it's not you know random seating, it's not anything. And the crazy part is this: now every event has a repercussion on what the next event is going to look like. It's no longer a clean slate. Like you have baggage after every event, like. Every mistake means so much more. Every mechanical failure means so much more. Like there, there is no, there's no reprieve. Like if you screw up, you're not screwing up for now. You're screwing up now and you're screwed up for the next event. That's the crazy part. Yeah, it is. Like it, it is. And I, but I also think that there's going to be, there will be a, a flip side to that as well. Um, right. Because you and I both know that uh, results are important, but it's, who you are as a driver, how you market yourself, how you take advantage of the situations you're in. I mean, clearly there's guys that have not been as successful as others, but have huge programs on a relative basis. And, and so how creative are they going to be leaning into this? You know, how are they going to yeah. treat their event weekends in terms of how they put things together, their program, their packaging, all that kind of stuff. Imagine like what you could say to a sponsor now in a situation where you have all these new opportunities. Well, how creative are these guys going to be? I can't wait to see. Well, like, you know, same thing. My marketing brain switches on. It's like, if you share a sponsor, cool, let's make a post for that sponsor. Head to head, what, you know, what driver's going to win? Or you could rekindle, you know, let's say Dan Briquette and Ryan Literal, who are on opposite sides of the bracket, make it the finals. We get an RB versus 2J debate again. Like, <laughs> we get to rehash that all yeah. over again. Yeah. You know, you could do you could have a rookie battle in the finals here. You, you have a bunch of rookie battles in here already, right? You could see uh, Connor Shanahan versus Hiro Manoa in the finals. Like we're, we're talking about one of the, the biggest up and coming drivers out of Japan versus one of the biggest up and coming drivers out of Europe who are get, who potentially could face each other just in the seating bracket alone. And then, you know, that split could then put them on opposite sides of the other bracket. And then you get to watch them fight their way up. Like just the possibilities are, are endless. Well, the storylines just are, are there. I don't know if we talked about this, but I, I'm, I'm asking you seriously because I've had this conversation with drivers like, OK, always there is 32 drivers that are going to make it into the main show unless you have somebody right. that, that has a double zero and you have below count or whatever. Right. So you're either right. going to go home because you didn't qualify or in this case you are going to go home because you lost a tandem battle. Now, the drivers that I've spoken to are, are saying, I would rather go home losing a tandem battle than not qualifying. What do you yeah. think? 
Yeah, I think not qualifying, double zeroing, whatever, ha- holds such a heavier stigma than losing a head-to-head battle, right? It's like it's it's like getting you know scurvy on the way to war or dying in battle. Which one would you prefer, right? That's yeah. that's yeah. kind of how I look at it. It's, yeah, yeah. I I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a driver. I'm a I'm a shit driver, and I've told people that multiple times. Either way, I'd much rather go out getting beaten in a in a battle than getting beaten by myself. Right. Yeah, for sure. That makes sense. Yeah, it's yeah. just I think there's going to be some there's going to be those one off b- battles where somebody that is I mean you have to let the course of the season take place, but somebody that was a really good qualifier that never qualified outside the top fifteen is going to find themselves in this seating bracket and is going to be going up against all the drivers in the series are solid. You never know what's going to happen. That all of a sudden becomes a story. Right. And with the wild cardness of, of Adam and Vaughn potentially not running full seasons and them coming back in, you know, that's more of a reason to do well in your bracket because you might fall into a seat and get Vaughn right off the bat. And, <laughs> you know, you could have a Vaughn Odie Bakshi's in seating. Yeah. You could, you could potentially see a top five driver from last year, not even make it into the main show. Right. It's kind of, the, it's the same as a double zero or the same as a, as a th- almost like a 32 out in a way, like the feeling of that when you're talking about it yeah. in the co- context of a championship. You know, I always, re- you know, always remember guys saying, you know, it's grade eights are better, it's grade eights are better. And so if, if you're if you're talking about somebody running for a championship, and so anytime you go out in 16 or anytime you go out in 32, it's kind of like puts a big damper on your championship. It's different now because the points are have been structured differently. But there's some similarities uh, uh, kind of across the board when you think about it in the context of like how much this is going to change the dynamics of how we get to a champion in the 21st season. Like, what is that story going to look like now? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be attrition. That's what it's going to be. It's it's going to it's going to be because the other part, too, is like momentum. Like Mm. you come like we've seen it. We've seen like. Nick Novak, great example. That is a driver with momentum, right? He His practice runs look great. He went into qualifying. He crushed it. He went into battle. And you, looking back, could watch him in top 32 all the way up and be like, this dude is going. Yeah. You are now going to have a group of drivers who know the track better than the drivers they're going up against in top 32 and have confidence and momentum. And that is a fucking scary combination. Track knowledge, car knowledge, confidence and momentum oh my god you're gonna i guarantee you're gonna see people coming out of seating win events it's yeah. it's gonna happen because they you, have all of that yeah what were you saying about uh, him where did he end up nick Novak. yeah well I, I meant more just like coming out of like long beach like you could see the momentum he had in practice oh i see i see example was, okay gotcha yeah gotcha. it was like was like trenton beach him in utah he didn't he didn't do super super well but it was the best event he had last year and you could see yeah. the momentum he got in practice and you know i i called it during the live stream we started up and jared's like who do you think's going to do well i'm like trent beecham i'm like i watched his last two practice runs he's crushing it yeah he did look and really good in that event this allows us to see ahead of time drivers with momentum going into it and confidence like you come out of that seating bracket and you just beat everybody that's it. Like you're, you're, you're there to destroy worlds. You're there to upset people. Yeah. You know, if I can, if I can quote, you know, Denny Hamlin, like your favorite driver is going home. Like <laughs> that's, that's what we're going to see. We're going to see, you know, drivers who traditionally may not have a ton of confidence, gain a ton of confidence out of nowhere and come in and just do ridiculous things. And that's like all of the, what all this entire system does one thing and it takes the the bottom what is traditionally rookies and drivers that have struggled and gives them more time and more more experience and more confidence to compete better and i honestly think you are going to see rookies go further this year than we've ever seen them go because of this system they're going to get up to speed so much faster yeah i think you know you don't want to look at any format change that you put in place um, and how it has an impact on a singular year, if you think that it's better big picture wise, the impact yeah. of something like this, if it's done correctly and it has the impact, uh, as we're kind of talking about it or inferring from some of the things that might happen is what happens three, four, five years down the road to the skill set in aggregate, not for any given driver, but in aggregate, what does that do 
for driver programs in terms of like their overall exposure and how they're able to put that back into their programs. And then getting everybody at a driver skill level where like you could imagine like the the limits are going to be massively, massively pushed in this kind of system because it's almost forcing progression, particularly with the pro spec guys, but also with the pro guys who are going to get so much more on track action that they can't get. Even if you go to a race weekend or sorry, even if you go to a track weekend with your buddies and you're banging it out out there, having a good time, going crazy. You cannot replicate a Formula Drift weekend with the top drivers in that circumstance, with that pressure, no. with the psychology that you need to have going up against that guy. You just can't. And for people that are in that seated bracket, they are going to get what the Osbo Fields and Bakchis and all the top guys get. usually get all the time. They always get 32, 16, 8, 4, 32, 16, 8, 4, 32, 16, 8, yeah. 4. Now these other guys, depending on how they finish up, if they stay in that bracket, you know, they might very well get 16-8-4, 16-8-4, 16-8-4, 32-16-8-4 win. You know, you could right. imagine something like that taking place, or at very at very minimum, the scales balancing out in a lot of different ways, not just from a skill set perspective, but from a financial perspective. I think the most positive long-term repercussion we're going to have from this is less driver dropout um, because you're going to have drivers that uh, you get drivers who never actually won a top 32 that just disappear. And whether that is financial or just emotional, like that's a tough pill to swallow. You made it to the, you made it to the show and you couldn't compete. Yeah. I could not imagine how difficult that is to, to comprehend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You now have drivers that are going to win battles that in the previous setup would never have won a battle. So that psychologically does a ton. And it also financially will do a ton because you are now going to look better statistically, um, whether it comes to like actual win rates, you're also going to do better on airtime and in the eyes of your sponsors. So I, th I really do think like, expanding this out you are going to see drivers with more money and drivers stay longer and and just less general dropout i think the problem you're going to run into is we're going to have 45 pro drivers that are all going to want in now <laughs> because why wouldn't you 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 have no reason if you're in if you can you can almost guarantee more airtime than you ever have before getting that sponsorship is going to be that much easier i do think we're going to run into an opposite issue in the next two years of like 50 petition drivers in pro, which is the best problem to have. It is the so. best problem to have. I mean, I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, you know, that I know that you're being honest when you give that sentiment. I, I you know, I, when we first started doing this, I, I think one of the first things I told you was I don't ever want to script out anything that you do. I don't want to tell you what questions you have to ask. I don't want to have, have to ask you, you have to ask me permission to say what you want to say. I want you to do the podcast as you want to do it. If something pops up that seems crazy, I'll let you know. I think there's been like one instance of that. Um, I think so, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I know you're being sin sincere when you say that. Um, and I really do hope that that is the case. Like a lot of things, you know, our hearts are in the right place here. Um, I feel like this is the right way forward. And, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it in terms of like, where do we go from here? Um, and, you know, I do feel good about it. I feel like that even at roughness around the edges in certain circumstances, big picture wise, this is the right decision. Agreed. Agreed. Well, I don't want to expand past that. Um, dude, I'm pumped. And I hope everybody listening and watching is pumped because you now get to speculate, not just seating brackets, but you can now extrapolate into the pro bracket or into the top 32 bracket as well and start picking your fantasy battles now and start thinking what could happen what could be because it's happening we're you know we're not far from long beach i'm gonna go to work baby gotta make those brackets Let's go i know Sick. think about it well, sir uh, oh yeah. go ahead go ahead go sorry ahead. No, I was just I, I was just going to wrap it up. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> wrap it up then. <laughs> I know you and I can do this forever. You and I can do this forever. But um, thank you again, uh, not only for obviously the 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 podcast and and literally um, for anybody listening, you guys get a copy of this episode about 
10 hours before it goes live. So it's not a lot of time for redactions. Um, <laughs> so thank you for that and the freedom to do that. Uh, thank you so much for the announcing thing. I have some massive shoes to fill and uh, I'm sure I'm going to screw up a bunch and there'll be a lot of big laughs, kind of like my call on Forrest Wang in Utah. Feel free to go back and rewind and see what I said there. Um, yeah. And I'm pumped, man. I'm, I'm super pumped for the season. This just gets me even more excited. I'm happy for you, man. And, uh, and, and cheers and let's have a good one. Sweet. And uh, for everybody listening at home, please log in and watch it because that's where you're going to see all the visuals and really be able to work through this bracket. Um, for everybody watching, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Make sure to share and uh, we'll catch everybody next week. 